August 24th, regular board business meeting. Our first order of business will be our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to report that the board met uh, October 24th, this evening. In executive session, we discussed matters of personnel and negotiations. Next, Andrew, let's have it. Report from students. Welcome. You look like you're getting around pretty well. It's good. Yes, I told you last month I'll be better the next time I see you. You're not and, a liar. Uh, yeah, I'm <laughs> off the crutches. I'm, I'm back. <laughs> um, well, thank you for having me. Unfortunately, Joanna couldn't make it tonight, but I'm happy doing it by myself. Um, well, it's getting a little chilly, just a little, but the time of the year means that fall sports are starting to come to an end, but not before Radnor teams, teams compete in the playoffs. Field hockey and both girls and boys soccer already made the district playoffs, so best of luck to them. Volleyball closed out their season with a fun and well-attended senior night. Also, Radnor boys and girls crew teams competed at the head of, Char head of the Charles Regatta in Boston this weekend. Radnor celebrated its fall sports season last Friday at Radnor's homecoming game, and although Radnor lost to Strathaven 21-14, there are plenty of fun festivities around the homecoming game. Before the game, by the football field, we had a barbecue tailgate. A large crowd of students uh, went to get some, get some food in them before cheering on the Red Raiders. During halftime, two Radnor seniors, Jack Bell and Adriana Dantzler, were crowned king and queen. Other members of the court were Macy Plotkin, Ryan Bird, Kyle Addis, Jack Horvath, Katie McShay, Hannah Jones, and Spencer Lasky. After the band played, we were back to a great football game that was a nail biter up to the end. After that great and fun game last Friday, the football team has a very important game against Pencrest this Friday. A win here would keep our playoff hopes alive. And the week after our win against Pencrest is the famous LM week. So I'll save all the fun details about that week for next month's meeting. Uh, but make sure you do come out and see the 121st meeting of Radnor and Lower Marion. The date and time are still up in the air, depending on whether or not the football team makes the playoffs. So even with all these fun activities happening around the school, we did not forget about our academics. This month, the freshmen, sophomores, and juniors took the PSATs. For juniors, this is the qualifier test to be a National Merit Scholar. Other senior and junior scholars were honored at the National Honor Society induction ceremony last night. The 90-some new members were inducted for their academic excellence as well as community involvement and service work. And finally, the freshmen were taught of the importance of academic integrity when representatives of, the, of Radner, Radner's Honor Council came to freshman home, homerooms last week to go over the guidelines that we have at the high school. Well, thank you for having me. Ah, uh, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Andrew. Mr. Bachelor. Good evening. Good to see everyone. I uh, just have a couple of uh, announcements and a couple items I just wanted to share tonight. Um, first off, before I begin, though, I did just want to make a share with the public and for the board um, that our posting of some of our public financial documents for today's agenda. Uh, we're working with a new uh, program, Board Docs, and we've offered some trainings for everyone, our public and our board members um, on Board Docs. Um, due to a, a challenge with Board Docs, as we're learning to use this new system, we are unable to uh, post some of our public financial documents until 1.15 today. Uh, in consultation with Board Docs, we figured out what was creating the problem, so we hope to not have that happen again, but just wanted the public to be aware that those uh, financial document attachments weren't posted until 1.15 today. Uh, the first thing I wanted to just talk about and mention to the board and, and community is uh, we have our technology integration study is, is, is up and been running since the spring and is in full swing. We just had an opportunity uh, to meet with students for student focus groups to hear student feedback with parents to hear uh, parent feedback. Uh, they've been seeking uh, teacher and staff fa uh, feedback as well. Uh, as the board knows, we set this as one of our uh, district goals for this year to evaluate and study the integration of technology, specifically beginning uh, looking at 
at our iPad integration at the high school and to have recommendations on how we want to move forward with that um, by January. And then the committee will continue their work um, looking at our technology program K-12 to and have recommendations for that uh, for the other pieces uh, later in the year uh, into the summer. Um, so, so far it has been going very well. Um, as I said, there's some pictures there with our focus groups. We thank all those parents that were willing to come into the times that were offered and thank the students for their feedback. Um, as we look at any of our programs, we want to make sure that we're taking the time to evaluate it, evaluate it both on its effectiveness, but also evaluate it, um, you know, looking at all aspects of, of the cost to the district and what makes sense for us as a, as a district as we move forward with our technology integration and for our students. So we're looking forward to those recommendations coming forward in January. And I thank uh, Dr. Uh, Maureen McQuiggan and, and Dr. Byron McCook for all of their hard work and energy. And there's a whole administrative team involved in leading that. The second item I wanted to mention to you was our sleep student start time committee. We're going to change this to an administrator sleep study, and we're going to study whether our administrative team and board members are getting enough sleep. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, I don't think we are getting enough. But uh, no, as we talked about, we identified as one of our priority projects to look at uh, student um, sleep and school start times. Um, for those of you who may not have been aware, or we talked about in the, in the spring, uh, that this is something that has been a national discussion discussion uh, for the last few years uh, with many different groups, including the, um, the AMA and, and the American Society of Pediatricians um, weighing in about the appropriate amount of sleep for our adolescents and for the, and the appropriate amount of, of what time should be the right time for us to be starting school. So we identified as a priority project to look at that this year. Um, there will be this week, um, our website will go live and we will be seeking um, community members, staff members um, to be part of the committee, um, to be looking at this topic uh, and then providing um, some guidance to the administration, both on recommendations on how we look at um, student sleep, but also recommendations based on school start time. This is another one of those issues similar to the previous issue with we're discussing with the iPads that, um, you know, I'm passing out the T-shirts. The no decisions have been made. Um, truly no decisions have been made, but we feel that uh, it is important for us to look at this topic uh, and develop some recommendations moving forward. And then the next topic I wanted to mention was um, the uh, district has been encouraging our, our community um, to vote no on the constitutional amendment. I will hold some of my remarks and allow um, Mrs. Goldman to uh, speak to this when she gives a GRCC update, um, but just want to encourage everyone that the district is encouraging um, all um, Radnor residents to vote no on the constitutional amendment in order to keep control of our Radnor schools. And the next item, I wanted to thank our Radnor Police Department for partnering with us to keep our students safe. It was the 21st annual Operation Safe Stop. Uh, one of the things I have really appreciated being here in Radnor is the partnership with our police and the, how they work with our students uh, and our whole community. And I want to thank all of those within our uh, Transportation Department and in the Radnor de uh, Police Department for, again, for having a very successful day and educating not only our, our students um, but our community about the safety safety uh, surrounding school buses uh, each and every day. And then the upcoming events, uh, you'll see that we have a lot of activities happening. Uh, I'm getting uh, a little excited and curious for my first uh, LM week, so uh, Andrew's going to help guide me through it, I think. Um, apparently I have a little piece or a role to play. I don't know, there's, I'm understanding. So I'm looking forward to that coming up event. Are you any good at dancing? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I got a little. I, 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 I think I got a lot of rhythm, actually. You know, I think. Doctor Costello and I had an act. Well, I, I think I might be confident that I might dance better than Doctor Costello. I doubt he's watching. Though. I would have been. I'm going to tell him that. Somebody clip this. Time stamp it. I'll be sure to send him those minutes. Um, but we are excited for a lot of the different events coming forward. And uh, last but not least, I want to just thank our donors. Uh, I want to thank Radnor Elementary School PTO for their donor donation uh, to the elementary school for us um, with dealing with the STEM grant. Uh, thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, next, we will turn to public comment. Uh, during this portion of the meeting, our citizens are welcomed and encouraged to address the board. On, on matters on the agenda or other topics related to Radnor Township School District business. We ask that you please uh, 
Print your name on the sign-in sheet at the rear of the room, and then when you come to the microphone, if you could please clearly state your name, street address, and the topic which you'll be addressing. Uh, individual comment is limited to four minutes. We ask that you please abide by that. Um, that's our board policy. If you're unable to attend the board meeting, we ask that you submit your comment by email to boardquestions at rtsd.org or in writing to Mr. Michael Petiti, Radnor Township School District, 135 South Wayne Avenue, Wayne, Pennsylvania. Administrators will review the questions the Wednesday following our meeting, and questions will be answered at the following month's meetings. That's committee meetings, and if there's nothing there, they'll be answered this evening. Welcome. Good evening, Judy Sherry, Governor's Circle, Newtown Square. Last April 25th, a budget work session was scheduled. Here is the agenda, which was posted before the meeting, and which clearly states next to public comment, quote, Public comment will be available at 7 p.m. Budget work session to continue as needed. A very straightforward description. The budget agenda issues were serious. Staffing, class size, and enrollment. After reading the agenda, members of the public arrived at the April budget work session meeting with questions and prepared comments for the board's consideration. But public comment was denied. Mr. Falcone is president of the board, and despite Ms. Stern's objections, should be held responsible for this determination. At the last board business meeting in September, the superintendent, Ken Batchelor, stated that clarification was needed regarding this issue. Quote, so I do want to be clear on the night of the public budget meeting, that very night, there were two opportunities for public comment. I would say that administratively we did not do a good job of advertising when that public comment was going to take place that evening, but I don't want people who are watching this to assume there was a budget hearing that night and there was no opportunity that evening for public comment." Unquote. Mr. Batchelor's comments are disappointing and obfuscate the issue. When Mr. Batchelor refers to public comment opportunities during the same evening, he is referencing the two opportunities for public comment provided at the business meeting that followed the budget work session, not opportunities during the budget work session. Mr. Batchelor's statements imply that, one, the prepared comments for one meeting can just as effectively be, de be delivered at the next meeting. Two that members of the public who are prepared to speak at one meeting should have no objection to waiting around to speak at the following meeting, even if their comments have no relevance or it's too late then to impact the board's direction. Three, the board president can disregard public comments in one meeting if time is available at the next meeting. This is absurd and totally disrespects the public. The school board schedules back-to-back -back committee meetings. If the curriculum committee cancels public comment, would these comments be effectively delivered during the ensuing finance committee meeting? Four, finally, how does the public comply with the strictly enforced four minute comment guidelines if it needs to commingle two different prepared comments for two different meetings? So I'd like to know what changes that the, will the board put into place to prevent this from happening again in the future? And my second comment, <clears throat> tonight the district is hiring seven new employees for the musical that were not on the payroll in the past. In the past, the jobs of these employees were paid for by the Booster Club for the musical, a club financed by $75 per student participant and also tens of thousands of dollars, sometimes up to $50,000, collected from the ticket sales. Apparently, the district will now be collecting the money from the ticket sales, which will cover the cost of these new employees. These are significant changes. As a result, to establish effective accounting and hiring in the future, full transparency is needed now about these past practices so that, and these past practices regarding, regarding hiring and accounting. The Booster Club's board requires this information to organize and effectively operate 
next year, and parents need this information to be sure the funds were and will be spent to directly benefit all the participants. Concerned parents have said they felt intimidated when they asked questions about this issue. A transition, and you know, I can understand this, because if you have, especially if you have a child that wants to be in the, have a role in the musical, you don't want to be a troublemaker. You don't want to be the person that's saying, hey, I'd like to see the accounting about what was done in the past. A transition offers an opportunity to be forthcoming about the past accounting, reassure parents, and clarify what happened in the past so that the best practices can be continued and others disregarded. For example, were background checks for employees properly administered? Who actually was paid and how much? And my question to the board is, are there Excuse board me, members Excuse me, Mr. President. Take We're over five minutes at this point. If you could please conclude your remarks, that would be great. Thank you. I just like to collect myself because when you're interrupted in the middle of something, it's really hard to Well, you're over your time. We gave you some leniency. If you could wrap them up, that would be great. Thank you. My last sentence, which I guess did not fit into the five minute, or excuse me, the four minute criteria. Are there board members that will take responsibility for this important issue and will share the results with the public? Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. Cindy Spertle, 106 Valley Forge Terrace in Wayne. Some questions on the agenda. And going through I, the question uh, I had last month on the meeting minutes is recorded as when will last month's questions be answered during this meeting? And I'll ask it again. Did an, I did answer that in my description. So the, the questions will be answered during the month's committee meetings. If not, then they'll be answered at the next board meeting. So if they haven't been answered at the committee meeting level, we should expect tonight that they will be, okay. If there's going to be an answer, they'll be answered tonight. If there's going to be an answer. <laughs> uh, the question also on the um, finance committee addressing the funding of field trips is still an open question that I have. One question I did have, thank you, the synopsis for the uh, revenue financial summary and the expense summary was included tonight, and that was a question that I did have. Um, just a quick question, interim taxes as part of our revenue appears to be 99% le less than budgeted. And the questions that I had uh, are, the, is, are the figure, the budgeted figures for this coming budget going to be adjusted to be more realistic or are there the interim tax I understand is if the property has been reassessed taxes are increased taxes are forthcoming and that's what the interim tax taxes are or are the people holding back on paying their interim taxes until the end of the year to me if you pay your school taxes you pay it all at once whether it's interim in addition to your regular property so that was a curious question since it's 99% less than the budgeted figure. And that's the first year that that happened. Um, on the 8.3 approval of contracts and or agreements, uh, the Power School, which is the new IEP software, I noticed there was an asterisk that the professional services, the on-site training and the module management uh, were all funded by medical access, but I noticed that there's approval for the 1920 school year and the 2021 school year, but there was not an asterisk next to those figures. Are they also going to be covered or are they coming out of the school district budget? And going forward to the request for to dispose of books and obsolete equipment, uh, I was, during the committee meeting, we were told that most of the equipment is donated and if it is sold, there's a very small um, uh, figure but I would like to request that the, maybe at the end of the school year, the included in the summary would be a dollar amount of exactly what happened to each one of these items. Uh, there is a policy 
706.1, which is referenced in the in the agenda that is followed, and that's not part of the policy, but would be an interesting request. I'm sure people would like to know if donated what the amount that we are writing or including in our in the budget forward for the school district. Um, the lunch tray pilot program, the, the committee voted to approve the pilot program for the month of November to give it a try. The question that I have, as I had then, what exactly is going to be, is to be expected at the end of this one month study. The actual cost of the new trays for the cafeteria actually double the cost of the current ones. Board recognition of the uh, new, the new, um, my apologies, clubs, student clubs, not included in uh, this agenda nor in the agenda the that was presented at committee this past week uh, were copies of the student club application. And my question is, was the board privy to the copies of those applications so they could make an informed decision as to whether or not to accept these requests by the principal? Then, to further speak just quickly on the um, new positions for the musical that are being asked for, the contracted services positions. These are new positions. Uh, are there job descriptions for these new positions before they are approved? And also, um, it, the, should an audit be performed due to this being a brand new uh, transition and how these positions have been handled in the past? I also uh, went, did a little bit of research because there have been questions raised in committee meetings about booster clubs and how their finances are handled. And noticed that there was a study done back in October of 2009 that was shown on the website, but there were not, there hasn't been anything done since then. And this was done by a member of the current CAC, so maybe that may be something that the CAC may be able to, to perform for the uh, staff. And another question on the district salary schedule for game workers. And the question I had is there is a game worker listed who is also an assistant coach. Uh, is that individual coaching and working the game in the same, during the same period? Thank you. Hello, how's everybody tonight? Welcome. Uh, David Wood, President, Radnor Township Education Association. I just wanted to make a brief comment about the upcoming election and hoping that everybody will get out and vote. I know this is uh, not a, not a well-attended election, and um, what's up for grabs in this election, not just for school board membership, but for um, the constitutional amendment is pretty unbelievably impactful for our district. And I just hope that everybody gets out because if they don't, and this thing were to pass, education in our district will change forever. And there's no, there will be no going back on it, I don't think. So I'm encouraging the public to get out and vote and to maintain the board that we have that's done such a great job so far. And hopefully both will occur as, as this election goes forward. Thank you. Any other public comment? Mr. Falcone, I have um, two from the public from email. Outstanding. The first is from Dan Webster, who lives at 242 Ravenscliff Road in St. Davis. Mr. Webster would like to request that salary information be included for all employees listed on the personnel action items agenda item each month. Presently, salary information is excluded for retirements, resignations, and leaves of absence. The next comment is from Rick Eckstein, 334 Strathmore Road, Bryn Mawr. Good evening. I'd like to speak in favor of the proposal for Radnor High School to participate in the Rothman Sports Injury Study. 
As many of you know, I have been research researching and writing about youth sports for the past several years. One major part of this research is the explosion of youth sports injuries, which may be related to the increased specialization in single sports or sports that are very similar to each other, such as soccer, basketball, and lacrosse. The Rothman study is one small but important attempt to understand why children are experiencing more sports injuries and what various parties can do about this. These parties include parents, coaches, school officials, and even PIAA. As one school board director correctly pointed out at the curriculum meeting, curriculum committee meeting, sports specialization is just one piece of a larger mosaic. This larger mosaic involves what might, might be called overuse injuries, which may have a number of casual factors, including, excuse me, causal factors, including but not limited to sports specialization. For instance, we often overlook the importance of recovery time in preventing overuse injuries. While the Rothman study does not focus directly on this issue, the survey will collect data on the number of hours students spend daily and weekly on their primary sport. If the data suggests that officials may want to address that explicitly. A recent example of this is telling. Earlier this month, a high school girls varsity soccer team played four games in an eight-day period. This is a recipe for overuse injuries. College teams in high-intensity sports like soccer play at most twice a week. World Cup matches are usually every four or five days. The coaches have done everything possible to minimize the physical impact of this harsh schedule, and school administrators here and elsewhere have only had so many days and so many fields to get in so many games for so many teams. In this example, policy changes will need to come from PIAA in terms of season and preseason lengths and the number of games played. Data from the Rothman study could well be an important component of these important policy changes, depending on the findings. Runners should proudly participate in this scientific research for the future health and well-being of its students and all students. Thank you, Mr. Petiti. Next, we'll look to our reports from the board committees, uh, curriculum committee. Oops, I got to Sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> yes, thanks. The curriculum committee met on uh, October 17th for two hours, which is longer than usual, uh, including lengthy public comment. On the agenda, we covered the uh, PDE comprehensive plan update, which was largely um, uh, procedural. Uh, number two was the Rothman Institute study, which Mr. Petiti just discussed in public comment. Um, the survey, the Rothman Institute survey proposed is to research the following hypothesis that single sport athletes have a higher incidence of injury than multi-sport athletes. It will involve brief survey questions and de minimis time from our student athletes at various points um, during their year uh, and sport. And the committee does recommend it for approval. Uh, I'd like to also point out that public comment at our committee meeting focused both on the importance of um, concussion risks, prevention and intervention, and also uh, the overuse um, as a source of injury, which Mr. Petiti again just went over. Um, so both came up uh, as ancillary, but we are in favor of this particular uh, survey going forward. Um, our third agenda item was the longest, and this wa uh, was the overview and then results reporting for three curriculum audits. The first was theater, and I will just briefly give you the summary uh, recommendations. One is that we rename two classes to theater acting and advanced acting from theater arts one and two, and expand and diversify per performance within these classes over a two-year curriculum cycle. This is so students who enroll more than once have a variety of experiences. Second was to develop a theater history course. Third is to continue to update, renovate, and organize existing facilities and equipment. And fourth was to explore opportunities for high school performances to both elementary and middle school students in an effort to engage them at an earlier point in their curricular life about the joys of participating in theater. Second, we uh, heard from gift, the gifted programming audit, and those results were as follows. Revise the GIEP process for teachers of gifted learners to work with students and teachers. Process for, uh, uh, engage a process for exiting students from gifted services if they no longer need specially designated instruction or specifically designated instruction. Then replace the SB5 with the WISC-5 IQ test for students undergoing evaluation. 
Uh, fourth is improve communication to parents and students. Fifth is to develop curricular aligned gifted programming options so that if students do pursue their passions and their interests in the context of a GIEP, that they do so in a way that does align with our curriculum. And then finally, to improve professional development, um, including the orientation for new teachers of gifted learners and um, uh, an assessment for regular, a session for regular teachers regarding the emotional and social emotional and academic needs awareness training that characterizes gifted learners. And then finally, we had the ELA audit, and um, the recommendations that came out of this were. Um, professional development in the area of written language. Secondly, revised expectations for written language district-wide. And this is a, a really a companion piece in some sense to the math um, uh, restructuring that we did over the last couple of years at the elementary school level. Um, the focus now is going to be on getting writing where it needs to be. Uh, thirdly, it was modifying the delivery model for ELA interventions. Uh, fourth, update ELA intervention materials, including Read 180, Wilson, Literacy Footprints, Rewards, Add uh, LLI kits, and uh, forgive me, I can't remember exactly what LLI stands for, and Maureen is not here, um, and additional professional development. Um, and then fifth, and this is specific to the elementary school, Substitute differentiated spelling for accelerated, accelerated spelling in grades four to five. Upgrade Faunus and Pinnell benchmark assessment. Pilot new edition of Making Meaning and Becoming a Writer. Pilot spelling connections in grade three. And conduct a site visit of a school using Fontes and Pinnell classroom. And finally, uh, item number four overall on the agenda was a review of clubs and trips. And to answer the question that came up, yes, we had a copy of the proposed clubs and asked questions as appropriate. Um, and we're recommending all that for approval as well. Sorry it was so long. Thank you. Mrs. Michelson, just to clarify, it's leveled, it's over here, Tony. Sorry. Leveled Literacy <laughs> Intervention is the LLI. LLI, Leveled Literacy Intervention. Yes. Okay, thank you. I was hoping somebody would pipe up because I, uh, I was, yeah, never mind. Go ahead. <laughs> thank you. Lydia, facilities. Thank you. The facilities committee met on October 10th briefly, and we only had three items on our agenda. The first item, which is on your agenda for tonight, is to go forward with an RFP for the high school bleachers, and this would be to investigate architectural services for various designs. And so it would be for Mr. Bechtel to start meeting with various groups to gather information about this renovation. The um, second item on our agenda was just to confirm that we moved the money from the Radnor High School for the wrestling, wrestling matches to the Radnor Middle School. All, the mats, right. The, all of the money, basically the high school was generous enough to donate their money for their mats to the middle school. And all of the money went for middle school wrestling mats and lifts. And the third item on the agenda was just a discussion of the administrative administration building boilers which are coming to the end of their useful life cycle, and uh, the district wants that to be on our radar. They will probably need replacement in 2018. Our next meeting will be November 14th at 5 o'clock. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question? It's just a question, Lydia. So the bleacher project, because having just spent the whole football season in those bleachers, um, yeah, they can't, even if we don't do them next year, they can't be left the way they are. Right. Like so, that, like Patty, the totally bleachers have been under discussion at the facilities no. oh, committee I know. for I know. this entire year. We know that they're not in compliance with American with Disabilities requirements. So the very least, the um, home side of the football stadium has to be renovated. But along with that, there's interest in looking at expanding the project. So. I didn't want to go into all this, but since you asked, um, we might be looking at upgrading um, concession. the concession stands and also looking at the turf field. So there's been lots of ideas 
put out there. And so this is we just really, timeline? this is to start the process of right. looking at what we might do. So I guess right. I'm just trying to be painfully clear here. Those bleachers are really in an unacceptable condition for this community. If we are not, if we are gonna expand the project, this is my personal opinion, if we're gonna expand this project to include other things and that in any way delays whatever has to happen to those bleachers, I am totally against it. We need to separate those projects. The bleachers have to be dealt with. If we're saying that we're gonna keep the bleachers for another season, then someone needs to do something about them. There is paint lifting. It's amazing nobody actually was injured this season so far. Paint lifting. The seats, the kids walk down on the seats. They got big, heavy instruments. The seats are literally teeter-tottering. That it is an unsafe condition, and I believe that we as a district cannot allow that to continue next year. It, if we're going to keep them, they need to be scraped down, cleaned up. The leaves need to be gotten out from underneath all the steps. I mean, you walk up the steps, and it looks like nobody's touched those bleachers in, in 12 months. I'm serious. I just have never actually ever seen it this way. It, that could be the transition of Leo leaving and perhaps his keen eye to things that, that maybe we, we didn't appreciate while he was here, quite frankly. Um, but they're, I'm, I'm all for whatever fabulous things we think we want to do out there. I'm not saying I'm against any of the suggested ideas that are put forth, but the bleachers just cannot be like that next year no matter what. Patty, hang on. Didn't, didn't this get discussed at facilities? Aren't you on facilities, Patty? No. You're not on the facilities no. committee? No, I am not. Oh, got it. Okay. But this was discussed. Um, okay. That's and there, point. I don't know how quickly this can move forward because there was interest in the booster clubs po possibly participating. Um, but to me, I agree with you. I think there's two points here. There probably is a lot of stuff that Leo did. We don't, that position is not, there's no one in that position. And I think we're all, everyone's that he in used a, to do. Yeah. So number one and number two, obviously yeah. safety is our, our top priority, so. Well, I just, I'm asking that we don't allow that project to get delayed because of something else, a grander, you know, a golden thing. And uh, I think points are all well taken. I think we all recognize the need to do the bleachers and we started to have that discussions in the spring. Uh, I believe a safety check, Mr. Stitzel, was performed um, on the bleachers, I want to say late spring, early summer, uh, and that they were deemed, um, you know, to be safe for use this year. But I would agree with you, there are further things that need yeah. to be I done. Mean, there's a definition yes. of safe. We are they agreed. may yes. be construction-wise yes. safe. But I agree wholeheartedly. But they're, not, yeah. Yes. I mean, the way the paint is ripped up alone, kids with bare feet walking through there, I, I just, yeah. I just didn't want, I just want to make sure that we did perform a safe check. So I just wanted to look to Mr. Stitzel for a minute. We did perform that check. Yes, and I did have maintenance go over that, uh, the bleachers before the start of the season. So I will circle back around with them and find out what they did. Great. Thank you. Susan Policy. Not finance? No, we did Oh, finance. Sorry. Okay, finance. Um, I'm going to give this report because Patty was not uh, present at the committee meeting. Uh, so we also met on Tuesday, October 17th and talked about the following items. Fees for attendance at district events, and we are going to be approving this evening admissions fees for the musical plays, pep rally, LM dance, and athletic events. It's on the agenda. Committee recommends approval. Um, we will be asked to approve uh, the change from styrofoam to biodegradable lunch trays, as was mentioned in public comment. Um, these trays do double in price from three cents per to six cents per, um, but we want to go ahead with the pilot and um, see how they hold up. Uh, this is being, I think, largely driven uh, by environmental concerns. Um, and just uh, dissatisfaction with the styrofoam. So we'll see how that goes and then get some feedback uh, to the committee on that. Um, thirdly, the high school musical position, positions that were also discussed in public comment, we are going to be asked to approve those supplementals for the high school musical. Let me go through the list since this has been a, uh, a subject of um, considerable interest. Uh, the positions which total $22,800 at the moment include the following a choreographer, a stage director, a technical director, a sound designer, 
a rehearsal accompanist, an executive producer, a costume designer, and a set designer. And of those, the two new positions are technical director and executive producer. And these positions are going to be funded, um, we hope, by existing proceeds that are currently resident in a bank account associated with the Parent Booster Group for the Performing Arts. Um, but the mechanics of that have not been totally hammered out. Um, but we will take this year at a minimum to work through to get that group back up and functional in a way that um, is responsible for all the activity as well as um, handling the finances for that particular, uh, for all those particular events. Um, we are being asked to approve these positions and the committee recommends that the board approve them. Um, we have job descriptions for them, although we have not, we don't approve job descriptions as a board, but job descriptions do exist. Um, we're also going to be asked to approve the following contracts. Constellation New Energy with an electricity rate of 0.0326, which is part of our Delaware um, Valley D DCIU consortium, and that's a great rate. Um, David Thomas Trailways, which will be transportation for Camp Canadensis. Source for teachers, addendums for changes in billing for paraprofessionals and subs and certified homebound teachers, fairly boilerplate. And then finally, the shift from PowerSchool to IEP software. And actually, that is an item, um, if you could, Byron, are you in a position to give us a little bit more background on the funds that are being used to pay for that? Um, it came up in public comment, and I was going to pull it if we couldn't get it covered here. Yes, uh, sure. The, uh uh, first year funds are coming from uh, medical access uh, funds, and that's going to cover uh, the the training, the implementation, and then the the first year cost of the software. Following that, for future years, I'll be budgeting that software, uh, just as we budget for you know our student information system and and other information systems that we have. What are medical access funds? I would have to defer that one over to uh, Kevin Kane, who. Uh, his office uh, is the one that uh, supervises is that area. Is this just a transfer of overage from a different account, or is this related to the, uh, this particular change? Uh, <clears throat> the reason we're using medical access funds is there, there are certain funds that we uh, gather uh, pro from providing special ed services, such as OT and PT. We've talked about this at different uh, meetings, uh, which are housed up, at the, uh, up in Harrisburg uh, with PDE. Okay. Uh, this was not... Uh, an expense that we plan to start in January. Right. Uh, so we're drawing down funds so that we can begin this uh, because of the uh, okay the so, end of the program. So my, my main interest was: Are these related to what we're doing here? And since this is um, this is related to IEPs, the answer is I yes. Think is yes. Yes. Okay. Good. That's what I was interested in. Thank you. Um, okay. And we are asking that those be approved. Um, we are gratefully accepting the RESPTO donation of $350 for STEM, and then uh, we are also approving disposals of outdated materials and equipment. Do you have a question? Yeah, I did. I just wanted to get clarity. While I realize and I appreciate that we read off the list, and I'm totally in with everything you said about the musical positions, um, I just want to be sure that I understood correctly that while we're working out the mechanics of whatever happens with the existing funds that Papa is holding and how we might go forward partnering in some way. I don't know how that'll be. Um, of these positions, though, that's $22,000. We do not have in our budget right now. There is, however, ticket sales that would be associated in this year that we could use to pay for these um, fees. I just want to make sure that we're covered, regardless of whether we end up with an agreement with them or not we need to be sure that we're whole on those positions. So that is the game plan, right? That is ticket one alter, ticket sales as, ticket sales as, yes, as certainly as one source of funds um, among several, which we haven't worked out Fair the enough. details I just for. want to make sure. Correct. Is that, okay. yes. Is that a, yes, okay. that's very good. All right. Sorry, I have a question as well. Um, what software are we moving to? Is, are we buying IEP Writer? Is that what you're proposing? 
uh, the the uh, software that we're purchasing is uh, Power School Special Education software. That's going to replace the current uh, IEP Plus software that we have. Uh, essentially, uh, when Power School acquired SunGuard K-12, they've chosen, and, and I think rightfully so, not to continue development with IEP Plus because the Power School product was far more superior. Okay, so we're moving from IEP Plus to Power School. Correct. Yes. Got it. Thank you. I am just not exactly sure I followed the conversation that Mrs. Uh, Booker and Mrs. Michelson were having because we had a different understanding at the finance committee meeting. So I guess I'll rewatch both of the tapes with regard to some of these. I didn't see the meeting, so I don't know what I, was discussed. I was just trying to understand it. I know that in, based on the conversation I'm hearing between the two of you, I have a different understanding, but I'm going to go back and watch the tape. It's fine. Are you ready for me to go on with policy? I'm ready to go on with. Are you, I didn't no. know if you're done. Great. I have a, yeah, we're done. I have a follow-up question. Okay. Since this could be moving us into the direction of this coming underneath the purview of, of the school, are any of the people that we're putting on, are they, are they part of the, the PEASERS program? And would that money count towards PEASERS? Because if it would, that would be an additional 40%. Are yes. There, are there, yes. So, yeah, I mean, if we, yeah, we will be paying those positions. Okay, so, so yes, I, we would be. I, I, Yes. Yeah. I just want everyone to realize that, that it, it, what it says, 22000 you may have to add a few more dollars to that. And as we move forward, if we decide to bring that so-called in-house, then that's a discussion that we need to have. Yep, but that was a whole conversation we had at the was, finance meeting. We, I, we I vetted it fully, either. Susan well, and I, I, Mike and I. I'll come back to it maybe at the finance meeting, but I mean, I would say that we can hire contractors without having to pay peasers. We do it all the time. so. We should talk about that if this is going to be an ongoing situation. And so, all right, you can do it in finance. Susan, I'm sorry, just, I didn't... So, just so you're clear, um, what the discussion that we had at finance uh, was very specifically laid out, and there have been additional discussions since that meeting that are suggesting there may be another way to handle it. That's all. Well, I don't, I mean, I'm part of finance and I was at that meeting. So no, no, no. I'm I'll saying just subsequent watch the, the meetings. meetings. Okay, fine. All Thanks. Right. Well, and I think one of the things we said is that those conversations should probably take place in public. So everybody's on the same page. So, so we. Um, uh, before we go to policy, just mention for finance, there was, uh, we did have a discussion. There has been a public comment question about uh, field trip funding. And I think we discussed at finance that uh, field trip funding is one of five topics that has been referred to the Citizens Advisory Council. Uh, the Citizens Advisory Council is looking at uh, five different topics to establish um, whether they're, you know, prioritize which topic the district should really, you know, delve into deeper and in, in what order. And one of those five topics is field trip funding. Um, so that is one of the topics they will be looking at. So the, fine, the uh, policy committee met October 10th. We had three items, two of which are you'll find on the agenda tonight. One is a rescission of policy number 210.1, which is possession and use of asthma inhalers and epinephrine auto injectors. We're rescinding that because provisions for that were incorporated into the newly passed policy 210 which came about as a result of changes in state law. Because of the changes at the state level, the district was required to make changes to policy 210, and we decided to bring them all together into one policy. The other item that we discussed that we have on the agenda tonight is a uh, blanket policy for first reading and request waiving of second reading. Uh, we had a list of policies that had some cross-referencing uh, errors. If you would like to know all the details, you're welcome to watch the policy committee meeting. But the upshot is that uh, when blanket uh, PSBA policies were brought over in 2008, some cross-referencing that was part of the 2008 policies were inadvertently left in our existing policies. So um, Dr. Rabarczyk has done a really thorough review and cleaned all of that up for us. I, I will, however, be uh, pulling it because there is one addition to a cross-reference that I'd like clear tonight. And then we had a, a really a starting conversation about another policy involving um, provisions and guidelines we'd like to have for school visitors. And our next meeting will be November 14th. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm going to review the Government Relations and Communications Committee meeting that took place on October 10th. 
One of the things that we covered was our goals for the year. We had initially discussed them the month before, but due to a smaller attendance than we had hoped, we brought them back. And I would say that the substance of the goals have been approved, but there was a suggestion for a minor rewording of one of them. So we will be bringing them back one more time to our November GRCC meeting for official approval. The other thing we talked about was the district's communications campaign on this vote no to joint resolution one. And I guess the question has been, you know, why, and I think we answered it pretty well at the meeting, but for those of you who want to hear it again, because I'm not quite sure um, if there are any lingering questions out there. But the reason why the district is putting out a vote no campaign is because we passed a resolution as a full board in January of 2017 opposing Pennsylvania Senate legislation that was called Senate Bill 76. And the purpose of Senate Bill 76 was to ultimately eliminate property taxes and have the funding for our schools come from the state government. And for multiple reasons, most importantly probably the fact that there, it would remove all of our local control to do what we do here, which is provide an excellent education system for our students. We, along with many other districts, said no. We've passed a, resol we passed a resolution against that. So why are we now saying no to Joint Resolution 1? Because there's ample evidence out there that Joint Resolution 1, which came about from a House bill that was passed by the General Assembly, um, is a proposal to amend the state constitution, which would essentially, without going into all the language of it, pave the way for legislation like Senate Bill 76 to be enacted. So to be consistent with our position on Senate Bill 76, it makes sense that we would ask people to vote no to this constitutional amendment that you will find on the November ballot. As I said, there is there's an irrefutable connection between that. Both state senators who have supported Senate Bill 76 have admitted in testimony that this is their backdoor way of accomplishing Senate Bill 76. And one of the people, Ron Boltz, who is the president of the Pennsylvania Liberty Alliance, said that he has, who is a primary mover and shaker behind getting the legislature to put together Senate Bill 76, is encouraging people to vote yes to this because as he says, quote, it isn't the full deal, meaning joint resolution one, but it's certainly a sign that we are absolutely having an effect. So when that kind of evidence is presented to you, you don't have a choice. And that is why we are, in a, along with Westchester Area School District and the Phoenixville School Area School District, are encouraging all residents of our community and hopefully beyond in Pen across Pennsylvania to vote no to this amendment. Let's find a, f a form of property tax reform that doesn't take away local control, which could be very destructive to the operation of our schools and the quality education that we provide. That impacts everybody. Because if you live in Radnor, you probably live here because you know the school system is terrific and if it isn't, that will impact you one way or another, whether you have children in our schools or not. So that is something that we discussed, and, and Mr. Petiti, I think you saw a sample yard sign out there that will be at the polling locations. There have been a number of different types of outreach that the communications department has done to try to reach uh, everybody, every member of our school district community and beyond. So hopefully um, we'll find out after November 7th that there's been a no vote, at least coming from Radnor, Westchester, and Phoenixville, if not further beyond that. Hopefully that answers questions about that issue, because I know it's come up a couple of times. Then Mr. Petiti gave us a, an update on the administrative regulation that goes along with the communication policy. Um, he is working on that, and that should be ready shortly. When he does have that ready, we will be rescinding three different communications policies, because the new one we placed we passed replaces those three. Then there was a, a very brief discussion of the PSBA legislative platform and last week's PSBA school leadership conference. Mr. Madden attended, I think, for all three days. I ran up and back for one day to hear a very um, interesting discussion from our Senate education um, leaders. leaders. And that was really eye-opening, and we won't go into that now. but. If you want to talk to us about it, we'd be happy to share with you what kind of dialogue went down there. 
Um, did you want to add anything to the school leadership conference? Yes, real quickly, um, we were in the audience listening to the chairman on the Republican side and the chairman on the Democratic side. And both of them expressed a concern that public education is being attacked at this point in, in Pennsylvania. So those are some of the things that, that um, I think actually, in my opinion, we need to be aware of. This was the first time that I was at a PSBA meeting where we actually had someone from um, the State Senate Education Committee come out and actually say that in public. It was filmed by uh, Pennsylvania Cable Network, PCN. Uh, it's available if you want to watch it. Uh, it's enlightening, um, but it will keep us, uh, keep us busy. The other thing we have as far as the uh, joint resolution one, the League of Women Voters of Radnor is putting on a forum for that, and they did invite the speaker from the Act 76 and Larry Feinberg right. from Haverford. And I think that it's the 27th, but I'll have to check. Okay. Um, we also briefly talked about the, an update on the fair funding lawsuit that was filed by William Penn School District mm -hmm. and some other schools. And we, taught, we mentioned it because the Pennsylvania Supreme Court reinstated that lawsuit. And reversing the lower court's rulings was a pretty significant move on the part of the state Supreme Court. So that issue is going to be something mm -hmm. that's discussed and um, a, a subject of conversation for some time to come. Um, Briefly, before I mention when our next meeting is, I wanted to also mention that uh, we hosted our fifth annual legislative breakfast uh, last week. Mm -hmm. And we had Senator uh, Leach, we had Representative Vitale, and we had Representative Charlton, our three local representatives at the breakfast. I want to thank Kevin Kane and uh, his assistant Claire, Michael Petiti, and many others for helping us put that on. And it was well attended. I want to thank our fellow board members who came and administrators. We discussed four different topics. And it was, it's a, a very unique and important opportunity to have that conversation with our local legislators one-on-one -on -one like that so that they can understand, and they come to us, so that they can understand our position on key legislative issues that they have to vote on. Uh, they talked a lot about how they hear things from organizations and groups, but we like to be able to mm -hmm. talk to them as the true boots on the ground. And we did talk to them also about the idea of expanding that concept so that it, we could, going forward, include the public. Because it's, a, it's really fascinating to hear them talk about their legislative process, and um, we would like to expand it to be able to mm -hmm. include more people, and they are open to that. So we will be having those discussions as the year goes on. Uh, our next meeting is Tuesday, November 14th, and it'll be at 8 o'clock. So have some coffee, and we'll be good to go. Thank Very you. Good. All right, don't kill me. Um, but on the topic of the vote, no, and I know we had talked about it, and I just, because I don't want anybody to be surprised on Election Day, but both of the political parties, I reached out to them. Amy was copied. Um, Mr. Batchelor was on as well. And we got word back from both political party leads that they will be helping us to endorse a vote no um, in their own ways, perhaps slightly differently, but, but a vote no is being supported that way. I'm glad to hear we have the posters um, I am, or the signs. I am interested to know, though, if, um, as we had discussed the possibility of creating a small palm card type thing, just a simple piece of paper that says vote no that we can hand to voters as they walk in the door. Are we contemplating doing that? Well, I think, um, Patty, as you had originally proposed it, you wanted to, it to be part of a mailing. Well, but I'm and not that, suggesting it's so a now mailing. So you're asking if it can be something just the district That does. the district would hand, just the district could provide to the polling places to have on the table if people so much as want to hand them to people as they walk by the door. That's what I'm asking. I mean, it's simple. It doesn't have to be anything. Yeah. No, don't, no need to spend money. Just throw it on our copier cut a piece of paper into three pieces and we could do it easy peasy but it just gives you yeah, something we, else to walk in we could talk about that and it and we can go along with the lawn signs that we put together and we could have yeah. a, a flyer that's there so we could talk offline after yeah I just if there's is, any way like to keep it in front of people as they walk in that polling place yeah. um, it, it, it might be helpful yeah I know I appreciate you're bringing that up again because after 
Um, it didn't work out for the through the party mailings kind of thing to know that there's the, this idea that the district just does it and puts it out there is something that we hadn't pursued. So yeah. and, and the parties are doing it their own way, which is awesome, but I just thought this might be helpful. Okay. Thank you. All right. The consent agenda, although our board action is required, is generally unnecessary to hold discussion on these items with uh, the consent of all the members there, therefore grouped and approval is given in one motion. In the event that a board member wants to discuss any item, the board president will move it to an appropriate place on the agenda. Are there any items that um, the board would like to pull? 11.2. 11, you said 11.2? 10.3, um, please. 10.3. 12, please. 12. Any other items? If not, I'll accept a motion to approve the consent agenda, less items 10.3, 11.2, and 12. So, so moved. moved. Is second. there a second? All right. Uh, all those, any discussion on these items? All those in favor? Any opposed? There are none. Item 10.3. Yeah, it's just a question and then a clarification. So it seems to me that there's already hundreds of clubs in the high school and each month we're asked to approve more clubs which is great kids are taking initiative this month we have 13 clubs um, and I'm just curious who who's participating in all these clubs that we're starting I just I just find that a lot of clubs to be approving and I, I see they've all got sponsors but I don't see any Mr. Bechtel's not here to do you want to take that or is that high school? Yeah, and I can respond. I mean, what happens is often, uh, you know, a group of students will come together and, and uh, you know, uh, I'll take example of the, the, the Radnor Glamour. Uh, Radnor Glamour Club was a group of students who came together and uh, for as part of their service, they wanted to go into um, assisted living and nursing homes and perform makeovers uh, for people in those, uh, in the, in those homes. Uh, so it can be a small group of kids that just come forward to the administration. They fill out the application to set up a club. They look for that club advisor, uh, and then they will then often share then to other students. So the, which you know who are the students? It sometimes often starts with a small group, and then as they advertise what it'll be about, other students will then often join and be part of it. So yes, so for all these new clubs, uh, there was a genesis of a core group of kids who came to, came forward uh, and said they wanted to have this set up. Okay, so then follow up. I'm glad you mentioned Radnor Glamour. So I notice on here that they're not going to fundraise, but then they're asking for $300, which isn't huge, but they're saying they want to approach REF, but they, there's no commitment on that. So, so how does this then roll if they are not going to fund and they don't get a grant from REF? Are we on the hook then for, because we're approving it, are we on the no. hook for the money? No. Okay. So what happens then? Do They'd have to come and ask for the money and we'd have to individually approve it. Okay, but since they're not asking for fundraising, I know I'm nitpicking, but it just it's seems like a there's a lot of these. So it, it's not a nitpick, but what they're saying is we think we're going to need these funds. We intend to go to REF to, to obtain them. If they don't, they'll have no funds, so their proposed activity would not happen unless they obtain those funds. They would then need to come back to the board and say, well, we didn't get it from REF, will you fund it? At that point, we'd have the discussion, do we want to give them $300? Okay. And sometimes That's kind clubs of the process. get creative, too, and they use sure. other means. They, they, they come up with other means to fundraise as well that they'll work with the administration on. But it's a good point. I mean, we're not approving the designation of those funds from district funds at well, this point. Yeah, and I'm, I am just kind of focusing on this one because there's so many each month. But this one says specifically we, we will not fundraise. So does that then tie them to not doing fundraising if they don't get the grant that they've said they won't they could certainly go back to the administration and come back here to the board and we could have that discussion or go talk to the administration so that would be an individual decision that they would have to make okay thank you well, we would, if they want once we approve the group i mean as long as it doesn't fundamentally change if they come back and say they want to do a cupcake sale we're not going to have to approve that correct the board would not have to they could work with the administration for that Year to year, these things change. Yeah. The different yes, the, the composition of a club could change. Their 
ultimate desire or ability to obtain funds could change. These are very fluid. It happens with every club, and um, you know we'll be fluid with them. So all right, so and, you know, and for, some go dormant. You know. Well, that's why I'm asking because it just seems like there's sometimes more and more complications with stuff that gets started. I just wanted to know, like, when does this all expire, and what are we on the hook for? Thanks. Thanks, Lydia. So uh, if there's not any other discussion on 10.3, I'll accept a motion to approve that. I move that we approve 10.3. Second. Second. Uh, any more discussion? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? Seeing none, thank you. 11.2. Yes. Uh, I pulled that to make a, an amendment to policy 006 which really all this was is a correction of cross-referencing. So they, there's no changing to the language. And in speaking with our solicitor, all this really requires is a first weaving, we, reading and a wave at the second reading. On policy 006, on page 6, number 23 and number 24, which are duties of school board directors, an additional cross-referencing of school code 318 and school code 9, 319 are required. And with that, I move that we approve these edits. Is there any discussion? Is there a second? Yes. All those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none? Number 12. So this is my question, um, and it relates to the additional um, musical um, positions. Uh, last month, we approved uh, the supplement for a choral music director. Um, and uh, as Susan, I believe, mentioned, and she's right, we do not approve of the job descriptions. Um, that's not what we do. We approve the money to pay for the jobs, but we don't pay for the job, approve the job descriptions. And I get that. I'm fine with that. My concern is that last month we approved money for a set job description. And now this month, we are looking at other jobs, new jobs, that apparently overlap with what we just paid for. So I see us double paying. And because I don't have those job descriptions in front of me, I can't say, OK, well, we, we're paying it for in this job description, in this job, and this one, and this one. But um, it's concerning because I see us using our taxpayers' money to pay twice. I would just respond to say that the, um, the supplemental we approved last week is the director of our whole musical program. Um, and in that job description, there are all pieces and all components of not only the musical, but also pieces dealing with different choral groups um, that have to meet. Uh, as the director, the director is in charge of overseeing all the different aspects of that musical. Um, obviously, though, we hire a choreographer. So the director has to oversee and make sure that choreography is done and completed for the show. But obviously, pieces of choreography are delegated to the choreographer. Lighting and sound is going to be delegated. So while the supplemental that we approved um, last month is for the director, all of these other positions really, in a way, are all contributing to and assisting that director in completing that musical. Um, so I think it falls very well in line um, with what the, uh, how the director's position is characterized and how these additional positions are characterized, which most of the positions are all positions that we've had before. It's just been a matter of funding source of where those positions have been funded. Um, we are creating two new additional positions, uh, and those two new additional positions we feel will help support our kids and support this program to continue to be successful. Okay, uh, I hear your point, and that makes a lot of sense. The only thing is, some of these descriptions are very explicit. For example, direct performances. So that's not saying hire a director to direct a performance. The choral director was expected to direct the performance. Um, organize and supervise ticket sales. I, I could go down the whole list. I mean, there's so much that we can cut out. It's sort of like if you said to me, Julia, we're going to pay you to uh, rewire the school. And I said, OK, great. And I turned around, and I hired someone else to do it. And I said, OK, pay me. So that's my problem. And I'm looking at some of these things. And I return props and costumes. I know there's a costumer now that's going to have that job. 
Uh, supervised technical work, lights and sound set. I know that there's a job for that. There's so much that we're double paying. And this is a real concern. Um, it's unfortunate the timing that we paid for, that we approved the old, this choral music director position and then approved all this overlap. Um, how are we gonna reconcile that? Well, I, I don't see that. I don't see that we have a situation where we're double paying. I mean, if we look at a, uh, an athletic activity and we look at the head coach and the assistant coaches, uh, the head coach is gonna be responsible for many of the same things that the assistant coach would just help with and help support. Um, we look at our own board policies. There's so many pieces that, uh, you know, that look at what the superintendent or superintendent's designee. Uh, there is no way possible as superintendent um, that I could carry out all of the pieces um, to running a school district by myself solely. Uh, it is the support of the entire group, the principals, the administrative team that does that. So when it comes to our musical, the supplemental that we proved last month is that head director, is that person that then oversees all the other components. So that person is ultimately in charge of overseeing all of those components. And part of that is selecting those people who will be the choreographer, that person who will be the light and sound, that person who will help as an executive producer. So I think it does fall in that overall um, position and it's not taking away, it is part of it. And if anything, having those many positions uh, increases the responsibility of that director. I think that shows uh, how uh, expansive and how detailed our musical productions have been. I appreciate what you're saying. The issue I'm having is it's so explicit. The, I mean, for example, uh, you know, keep financial records, pay invoices, and make bank deposits. So I pre he did not, the position, what happened last year, for example? Who oversaw that? I, 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 we can sit down offline and sit down and look at that more You know closely. what, I feel more comfortable doing this publicly. I think Lydia brought it up. I think it's time to figure this out because I have so many questions. You know I've been questioning it for months now. And um, I'm just, nothing's hanging right. And I'm concerned. Well, Julie. I, I was just going to say that I mean, we, we discussed this in the Finance Committee, and this is part of why I was puzzled about the conversation between the two of you, is that I thought that you know you, this was something that the administration had looked at. You brought it to us as the recommendation. We even talked about whether or not there would be job descriptions, and I asked you, I said, Ken, is this going to stay on as a supplemental ongoing? And you said, you know, no, that's to be determined. And that I thought we agreed as a committee that we would evaluate this in the spring and so, I mean, I guess inherent, Julia, with all due respect to your concern, and I hear it, you know, the fact of the matter is this is something new Ken wanted to try this year in response to some, you know, things that he just, you know, that were brought to his attention, concerns, in an effort to keep things moving forward, and that you, you're going to have us reevaluate this in the spring. Sure. So right. at, at most, it's a one-off kind of thing. I'm, yes, I, but I it is, I'm, but it is, let me just share, it sure. is, so what, what, and this might help answer your questions. Um, so... Uh, seven, eight years ago, um, the district set up, the business manager here in the district seven, eight years ago, set up uh, with both the, the musical booster parents, um, set up a scenario where they would be in charge of paying for some of these additional positions. So recognizing, and then prior to that, I believe the district did pay for those positions. Um, recognizing that those positions are needed and are part of the musical, um, it was set up that the booster parents um, would be able to collect the fees from the ticket sales uh, for our musical. They would be in charge of collecting those fees and that they would use those dollars and any other fees they charge students to offset and pay for additional positions and other aspects of the musical program as well. Uh, as we are moving forward and looking at dwindling participation in our booster club right now, um, this past year we had, um, you, know, uh, you know, we didn't have all of our positions filled amongst um, our, our booster club this past year. Uh, so in moving forward and looking at that and trying to understand what would be the best structure as we move forward, we've recommended that it would be best for the district to take over those positions uh, this year as we evaluate how we can partner with the booster organization, how we can help them get restructured and reestablish themselves as a booster group. And for us as a district to also discuss, maybe we want to go back to being in charge of the ticket sales at the door. Maybe we want to go back to being in charge of paying all of these positions ourselves. We felt the need to put those positions forward right now at this time of year because the musical is about to begin. So 
I'm, I'm embarrassed because I'm going to look like I'm patting myself on the back. This whole scheme, this whole plan to have all these paid positions was an idea I presented to finance. And I'm, I'm glad you took me up on it. I think it's a great idea. So Susan, I'm not saying that it's not a great idea. I think it's a wonderful idea. My problem is the overlap that I'm pointing out, the double pay, and it's not being addressed. The order is out of whack. So what I actually think I heard from Mr. Batchel was he does not believe there's a double pay, Julia. I, and I so we, we've that. all got so we've I, all got I the have same the information. Job description right here. I appreciate I'm what you have, verbatim. Julia. Julia, please. I hear you. This board hears you. You feel there's a concern. You feel there's a double pay. I'd like to hear from the rest of the board. You all have the same information. Mrs. Bonnenberger has presented a concern here, and it's a real concern for her. But Mr. Batchelor has answered that he does not believe there's a double pay. I've also looked at this information. I do not believe there's a double pay. I believe there are individuals who are subordinate to our overall theater director. And those individuals are, in, are charged with different tasks as part of the musical. That's what I heard from our superintendent. Uh, we I, have to continue this discussion and move it forward, right. but there is a real concern by Mrs. Bonnenberger, and we should address it and then move on. So I need something clarified. I pulled up the minutes from our last meeting. So on here, there is an individual who's paid $6,929 to be the theater arts department director. And then that same individual we are voting on tonight to pay an additional $4,000 to be the musical technical director. Um, and then last month we voted for an individual to be the vocal chamber singers director um, for $6,929. Is there also another individual that we voted on last month to be the musical theater director? So that's, that's a good question and it's important information. What you voted on last month, that 6,700 or what was it, Lydia? Yeah. $6,927, one for a theater arts department director and the same amount for a vocal chamber singers director. So the vocal chambers singer's director is the position that Mrs. Bonnenberger is addressing specifically tonight. That I'm sorry, I, just for clarification, that's different than the choral music director. That, that's the position. That's, so that, she's reading something different. That was Dr. Connie's position. Yes, yeah, there, there is. There is, and I noticed this as well. The way it is worded, both it is the, the choral director, but there are two positions. The one choral director position um, that Mrs. Bonnenberger is mentioning does have responsibilities. It is a supplemental for $6,000 that does include not only the musical, it also includes the director of some of our girls and boys ensembles. So there's many components to that. So that one position for the $6,000 you mentioned mm -hmm. does do not only our musical, it also does several choral groups as well. It was created several years ago okay. as one large supplemental. It unfortunately has been called many things okay. over the years, choral music director, vocal ensemble, that's that one piece. The other piece is our other theater teacher who runs fall and spring plays, not the musical play. That theater teacher has not historically been involved with the musical and he will be joining um, and working, or at least he was involved, I believe, the last two years. Uh, he will be in, involved in joining and working in the musical this year. And so that's the additional cost for him. He will be involved with the musical. And that's one of the new positions. Okay, well, that does seem a bit out of whack. If he's going to be making 4000 more overall than the person who's in charge of the whole musical and all the choral groups. But what you have to understand, it's a separate position. So. so uh, okay. The, so the second $4,000 position you're talking about is being brought on to assist the overall director. Okay. And that's the 6000 um, The director six is 4000 the additional. Right, the $6,927. That's your director. And then there's a, there's a new position being brought on to assist mm -hmm. that. He's delegating responsibilities down to that position as well as the others you're seeing. So why you see a, a double pay to that second position mm -hmm. is because the supplemental that we approved for the theater arts department director is a separate job from the one he is accepting to assist okay. in the musical. That's a job I, understand, I believe I understand, had. that's what I heard you saying. But so the person who's actually in charge of the whole musical is also doing all the choral groups. That's correct. So should there not be 
an extra supplemental for uh, him I will, as well. I will tell you what has been it an seems a bit out of whack to me. I, I will tell you what has been an interesting outcome of all of this <laughs> is been that we are getting, um, we believe right now, one heck of a value out of that position. Um, that the, the current position that is running our musical and running several choral groups. Um, you know, I'm not going to look at the audience. I think he's sleeping right now. But uh, um, that has been something that has, we have recognized that that position um, is doing a great deal for what is $6,000. Yeah, I'm going to repeat. It seems a bit out of whack to me, but then we'll just so go with that. To, but to so your the point investigation to was, was going the other way. It was perhaps we're paying this individual too much because he's not doing enough under his job description. Yeah, no, so, no. I think he, it's not But that was enough. part of the analysis. The analysis that was done is, are we appropriately compensating these people in their supplemental? And what the outcome of that is, is we are maybe, in fact, so, why I, so I think that that's the reason why I said, as we discussed in the finance meeting, and the finance committee, three of us approved this, Ken would like to take this year to look at how this all goes. It's his first year, as you know, full year in the job of superintendent, and he is going to come back to us after this all plays out this year. And so while I respect that Julia has concerns, I, I personally feel comfortable that you know, we don't know what we don't know right now. There's a little bit of difference of opinion here. And I think what's best is to let Ken go with this this year and give us um, his considered, experienced opinion in the spring. So with that, I'm going to make a motion that we approve. Wait, I well, have, we have to more conversation. There's more discussion. Absolutely. Well, I, th I thought there has to be a motion for conversation. That's why I'm well, saying Well, so we're having it, then we'll call for the motion. But okay, that's fine. There's still more board discussion at this point. So we'll be back. We'll be back. Is there any other uh, member of the board that would like to address this before I turn the floor back over to Mrs. Bonnenberger? Yes, yeah, so I guess my, I'm just all I'm, uh, I don't really, I'm following the bouncing ball. Um, I have not, my kids have not participated in these programs, so I don't really have a personal experience to draw upon from them and how much work it is or how much it isn't. Um, but I do know, <laughs> I'm sensitive to concerns about supplementals since for almost 18 months, maybe longer, I had to vote no on all these supplementals because the supplementals just had not been reviewed for a really long time. They were definitely out of whack. We took a long time, we did it, we went back through it, and we've only recently, it really was the end of last year, really in, that informed this year what, what we're seeing now, um, that we, we think that we, and we probably got 90% of the way of getting everything kind of straightened out. I have no doubt there's some cleanup work that could possibly be done in that area now that the heavy lifting's over. This might be that area. So I guess as finance chair, I would just like to ask then, as you're making your way through the analysis of what's going on, correct specifically around how we support our arts program, the musical arts program, maybe it would be helpful to come back to the finance committee looking at this as a holistic what are we doing with these, that area of supplementals and do we need to make any adjustments one way or the other? Taking those job descriptions into consideration because while I understand and appreciate and I'm sure there are job descriptions for these new positions, I've not yet had a chance to even read them. We don't approve them, not asking to, but to understand them because they do inform what the salary should be for those supplementals. So I just, I would ask for it from a holistic point of view. If we could do that, that'd be great. Yes. Um, Insofar as the job descriptions and Julia's concern, your concern um, about what's on it and is it being done and are we double paying, I also think it's important to recognize that we did have this large supplemental review over the last 18 months and I voted no right along, in fact, before yeah. you did, I was voting no because I felt that it was important that we go through all that exercise. Having said that, um, I also think it's important to recognize that there was a, a, a pretty significant shift in terms of the way the theater group was handling its financial affairs. At one time, the district did it, and the business manager, Mr. Vale, who preceded um, Michelle Deco, um, decided that based on his review of, of the district's ability to do this well, that we weren't doing necessarily a swimming job in terms of handling the cash. Uh, handling the cash was fine, but we weren't making money. Um, 
and he, uh, in consultation with the people at the parent group, um, decided that it would be an interesting experiment to see if they could do a better job. And in fact, that was what happened. So there was a transfer of this activity over to the parent group under the uh, supplemental holder who is overseeing the entire thing. I think that while that activity happened, and there was a general sort of review of the language. I don't think the language was written legally or in a, an ultra precise way. Um, and I would say that as a reasonable reader looking through this, one could reasonably conclude that um, his oversight or awareness that this all falls under his activity, but that he personally was not engaged in it, is reasonable. But because this has been pointed out and there are now questions about it, we have adjusted the language in that supplemental to make clear that he is overseeing but not necessarily self-performing these particular activities. Um, so that's just the idea of the job description and how that happened and the fact that it was loose and now it's tightened up and we appreciate that being called to our attention. Um, secondly, I think it's important to point out that neither that this particular position that was approved last month is by no means the richest supplemental that we pay by no means um, there are sports uh, coaches and so forth and other people engaged in other activities that are making thousands of dollars more in supplementals than this particular position um, pays for not over only overseeing the musical but also the other theatrical production, uh, other uh, choral productions um, that are going on in the school. So to the extent that that is the case, I agree with uh, the notion that we need to take this year, now that the spotlight is on this and we are seeing that there are things that don't necessarily um, add up as neatly as they ought to, to figure out what those numbers ought to be, who ought to get paid what, how the job descriptions ought to read, and take the year and fix it so that this time next year, we're not talking about this because it's running properly and it has the oversight that everyone uh, expects and is appropriate for a parent group, uh, a parent booster group uh, affiliated with Radnor High School. Uh, and I think that's a very achievable goal and I'm confident that we can get there. Uh, Amy or Chuck? Yeah. Talk about following a bouncing ball, uh, this, this issue. <laughs> Um, I would have to you know, defer to our, our superintendent, but I am very interested in finding out how we're going to move this forward and how we're going to do it properly. Uh, and that's the way it should be done. And I can understand where Julie is coming from. Uh, when we look at these, we're, we're concerned about um, levels of management. We should be looking for you know, the world's flat. We don't need people overseeing people overseeing people that oversee the people that oversee people. We don't need that. Those are some of the things that you're going to be looking at, and you'll come back and tell us how we can do this, not only professionally, but effectively, responsibly, and make sure that we're taking care of the taxpayers, the dollars that we are now putting out, expecting to get back from a booster club. That's all I have. Amy, nothing. So I'll offer my thoughts and then turn it back to Julia. Are you, are you good? I mean, really? Yeah. You guys said you didn't see me talk at the last meeting because you didn't watch it, so here you go. Uh, the, I'm, just to address the double pay concerns, um, my family's been involved in musicals in Radnor since 1985. Uh, my dad hasn't missed a year playing. In, any of, there used to be three a year, uh, the high school and middle school levels. Uh, I mean, you know, they're putting these things on between the directors, light director, stage crew, you know, I did all that. Um, behind the scenes, I was forced once to be an actor against my will. Um, it's a collaborative effort, so I'm not worried about the double pay because you can't do the light design, the sound design, the choreography, any of that without you know, a lot of overlap, a lot of collaboration, the head coach, assistant coach thing, you know, it's like a football coach, right? He's the head coach, he has the defense coordinator, offense coordinator, line coach, defense, you know, all that. So uh, I'm not worried about the double pay thing just because of the amount of time these people put in and the collaborative relationship and just the nature and the way it is. Um, 
usually these people put in, you know, if you took the hourly rate, calculated that out, these people are woefully underpaid usually. But the over the double paying thing, uh, I just I'm just not seeing. So. Thanks, Mike. Welcome, Dave, and thank you for the opportunity to let me speak tonight. <laughs> really happy to have you. Thank you. <laughs> I want to hear about his acting. Amy. <laughs> I just wanted to bring something else to this issue, and we're approving a lot of professional positions. And I just don't want it to be lost in the conversation about pay that this is a show for students to gain experience in theater. So when it comes to sound design and technical direction and stage direction and choreography, uh, I hope that there is, because I think there's been a problem with this in the past, I have a little personal experience with it, that that this really should be, in my view, for students. And to whatever extent students can own this production and take on leadership roles in this production, I think that's really important. So it's not necessarily addressing the double pay issue or whatever, but as everyone's talking, it's, it's something that um, I think is really important to keep in the conversation, the larger conversation, that, that students hopefully will take on these roles and get real-time experience and won't be shut out by an adult because I know that there have been situations like that in the past. And that has been part of the discussions and something that uh, everyone involved wants to see and it does happen um, right now but looking at how we can continue and let that grow uh, is something important as well. So I, that kind of dovetails, Amy, with what I was going to say which is um, I personally, again, do not see an issue with the double pay, but I see it for very similar reasons to Amy. I think as a result of what Julia has brought forward, as well as some other families, there is going to be progress made here with respect to our musical and the way that it's handled, the way that it's run, and the experiences that our students have. Uh, it will be changed for the better, I believe, and, and a lot of that can be, can be laid at Julia's feet because she, she brought some of these concerns to us in a way that forced our attention there. That's a good thing. Um, some of these additional positions that we're bringing on, I believe, again, to your point, Amy, will allow individuals, our students, that have maybe a specific interest in something other than the actual acting or the choral or the music, um, to have somebody there, some adult, to assist them to grow that interest. If you're a stage crew person, if you're a lighting person, if you're a sound design person, and we have now somebody there, a teacher or a consultant that is, has an expertise in that area, I think that can only benefit our students to maybe develop a love for that. So I think there is progress here. I think it's a good thing. I think we're going in the right direction. I believe in the path that Mr. Bachelor's laid out for us and for this program this year. I'm. Um, interested to see how it'll be out in a year, but I think, I think we're moving in the right direction. Okay. Julia. Another issue that you all brought up, and Ken, I just have to quickly correct you, and you have not been around long enough to know this. Uh, there has been no dwindling of PAPA activity. PAPA parents are probably the fiercest volunteering parents I know, okay? Uh, so I'm not going to go into reasons why the leadership uh, positioning is not where as robust as it ought to be, but these parents always have been very willing to step up and do what they have to do, always have, always will. So very different issue. So you brought up the issue that um, we had in place at one point, the person overseeing the musical was charged with uh, the money, with supervising ticket sales and organizing, and, I mean, keeping financial records, paying invoices, and making bank deposits. I'm reading straight from here. And you say that uh, our own <laughs> finance person said, you know what, we're not going to do that anymore. That's not your responsibility, and took it over and gave it to a parent. So here we are down the road with this big pot of money uh, and RTSD cut off um, our oversight of it um, when we were paying an employee to do it and said to the employee, no, 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 don't oversee it anymore. Um, and isn't it true that this money was started with our tax ID number? Is that true or is that? I was told that. 
the one of the things that we have discovered and we've talked to them about is that we believe they were using our tax ID number when they need to incorporate and have their own tax ID number. So that's one of the pieces we have asked them uh, to correct in moving okay. forward. So this um, big pot of money is currently attached to our tax ID number? I couldn't answer that. I do know that um, I, all I know is that some of the purchases where like if they're buying t-shirts or they're buying things for the the show um, I know that in some instances our tax ID number was something that it was used um, and that's something that they shouldn't be using if they're buying it from the boosters the boosters should be incorporated on their own um, it is something that I think in every district it's something that we need to remind our boosters and make sure that our boosters aren't using our tax ID number uh, unless they have approval for that okay um, but I also don't know the history of when some things were set up seven years ago right. as well. But, you know, history is one thing right now. We ought to know, though, if this account is tied to our, tied to our ID number now, shouldn't, shouldn't we find that out? Right now, we know the account, it belongs to, there is a booster account, and they are no longer using our tax ID number. So they are no longer. Well, they are no longer allowed to make purchases using our tax ID number. That is correct. Because um, once we discovered that, we addressed that with them. Recently? Yes. Okay. I think there's an open question as to when the bank account that is currently in existence was established. It may have been established years ago and simply changed signatories over time. Sure. And at least four to five years ago, there, the theater group had, a, had bylaws, officers, and was functioning properly, if not profitably, properly. Right. Okay. So we have this big chunk of cash. And... Radner was responsible for letting things go off the rails, not this employee who we paid to oversee it. Radner said, no, 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 let parents oversee it. Radner had it tied to our tax ID number, and Radner has always and continues to require parents to pay into this fund uh, in order to participate. Case in point, last night, 11 p.m., I wrote, a $320 check to uh, Papa for a Papa field trip. At what point is the school responsible for seeing what we got, for overseeing? I, look, accept the mistakes. We made mistakes. We shouldn't have let it gone on. At what point do we step in and agree to audit this pile of money? Because it has been so uncomfortable, and writing that check last night did not make me feel much better. And there's more checks to be written, because guess what? This weekend, it's the musical tryouts. And where am I writing my check to? Papa. Excuse, excuse me, Mr. Falcon. I, I really, I so respect your concerns. You, you know that. But I feel like this is, we, we had a question brought forth about the supplemental and it, it's kind of a specific purview, and that this has turned into a much bigger conversation. And I kind of feel like it's, it's really unfair to, um, you know, booster parents who might be listening, not even necessarily musical, but other groups who might be wondering the implications. And if we're going to have a full-on conversation about, you know, boosters and money and roles and all sorts of stuff about, about the booster parents, I really feel like that's a conversation that we should, um, if, if the decision is made to have that conversation, which is fine, but it should be on an agenda so that parents in the community are aware that the conversation is happening and occurring um, because this doesn't feel like the, the, the way to do that conversation um, without any notice tonight. I, I realize that you pulled the agenda question with regard to concerns about the supplemental, but this is, for me, it feels like this has gone into a whole other arena um, that I'm just not comfortable with given that it's not on the agenda. I think well, that's a fair point. Uh, Julia, if we could kind of focus our discussion to the supplemental. Uh, well, but it's tied into what you just brought up. You just brought up a wow moment where a school district employee told a school district, another employee, not to follow the money. And now we've got a problem. Now we've got a problem. Yeah, I, so I, I, I sure don't I understand that. Yeah, I don't know if that's, that's what we heard. But I agree with Mrs. Ms. Stern that um, if this needs to be an agenda item for our whole board to consider, we, we can do that. But that... That's not what you've pulled. Or if you want to make it an item of new business, I think that would be maybe more appropriate. That's a fine but, idea. Um, I don't think it's appropriate for the supplemental discussion, which we're voting on. So I think we could probably call the question on our supplemental. Can I just add, just before you call the question, it's related, and it's related this way because we're paying these supplementals with 
money that we're getting from somebody else. So it is related. And in many places, what, what you would do when you shift from one source to another source, the first source, before I would take over the responsibilities of this new program, I would find out what happened with this other program, and that's, what, that's where you do have a forensic audit. So I would welcome the fact that, and I do agree with Susan, that this is not the time to speak about it, but in the future, yes, I think it might be. So I'd be willing to discuss it publicly. And we should have the discussion publicly, Chuck. So um, I'm going to call the question on the item number 12 on the supplemental. Is there a motion to approve number 12? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Any opposed? 8-1. Patty, did you get that? Okay. Thank you. So that concludes the consent agenda, I believe. Next we have our... Reports, yep, from our board liaisons, uh, Delaware County Community College. Yes, thank you. Delaware County Community College has their special dinner tomorrow night for the school board members of the sponsoring school district. So please come down. If you haven't submitted your RF RSBP, I'm sure you could call and say you're coming and they would welcome you. And it's especially important because the new president is going to be presenting to us for the first time. And then after the dinner, the liaison committee has our meeting scheduled at 8.30. So I will have a full report next month. Thank you. Great. DCIU. Um, yeah, so a couple things. The um, STEM ecosystem is the group that I think I've, formally, I've informed you guys about before, uh, made up of uh, school district representatives, business representatives, community representatives, and higher education representatives. We had a really good workshop a um, couple of weeks back. And we've identified um, several approaches in terms of what we're going to try and do across the district. Um, but one thing I'll just put out there is we start to put our messaging together around it. Um, I really encourage people to, to contemplate STEM not as a thing, it is not a subject, it is a way of thinking. And that's gonna really be the messaging that we're gonna be working on as, as a group to try and elevate the way that um, we encourage kids to think in a variety of ways, not just through science, technology, engineering, and math. You could throw arts in there, there's all sorts of subjects, but it was a really, really good session. And uh, we coalesced around very specific goals uh, to be played out within all the school districts in the county, and I'm really excited about it. Um, from a DCIU point of view, business-wise, we did spend about 15 minutes at our last meeting, have a dialogue around the vote that's coming and what it means, and of course, for certain school districts in Delaware County, they're, they're divided on, on, on whether this vote is good or, or not so good. Um, so there's not one big united message, but it was a very healthy conversation. They were interested to hear what we were doing. I shared our communication plan, et cetera, and, and some people did pick up on that. So um, other than that, it was business as usual. Federal Relations Network. Here we go. Sorry. That's all right. The Federal Relations Network, uh, I will be attending a, a conference in, in Washington um, to discuss with our congressmen what are some of the issues that we face with the federal pieces. I'm trying to schedule a meeting at our congressman's uh, local office to meet with him and discuss some of the things ahead of time so that when he comes down, he'll be ready to give me some answers um, about them. I will follow up this time with some type of a presentation in the government uh, relations uh, committee with that. So the next item, the IU Legislative Council and PSBA, we're going to split. We're going to get two different reports. So I IU. Was, yes, I was not available to be at the IU Legislative Council, and Amy was. So she will report out on that. Great. Yes, and I was just chatting with Chuck because it, I have the title as the Delaware County School Board's Legislative Council meeting. So we'll 
talk about that in a second, but um, it was on October 11th, 2017, and it's a member of each school board from Delaware County who comes together. It's facilitated by Larry Feinberg, who is a, a longstanding Haverford School District School Board member and a, has a standing position with PSBA and is president of the Keystone State Education Coalition. He gave us, the, the items that were discussed were an update on the state budget, which is probably the same as it was on October 11th, come to think of it, since it hasn't passed. Um, we did talk about the Homestead Exclusion Constitutional Amendment that we spoke about a little bit earlier tonight, Joint Resolution 1. Uh, we also, there were a few topics related to accountability and ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act. The education chair, uh, the Senate education chairs wrote a letter to the U.S. Department of Education. They are not too happy with the Pennsylvania Department of Education because they felt that they weren't being consulted when that plan was submitted to the federal government and that the Constitution dictates uh, that um, it, it is in fact the legislature that should be making decisions and PDE should just be making recommendations. And they felt that they were usurped and there's uh, a little battle going on there. We also talked about these two chairs having introduced Senate Bill 756, which would look to eliminate the Keystone exams altogether, not just as a graduation requirement, but they're proposing replacing them with something like SATs or um, and SATs and what's the other? ACTs um, to satisfy the federal requirement that Keystone's currently occupies. Um, funny. <laughs> um, and the other bill they discussed was House Bill 995, which is about innovation in schools. The next meeting for this group will be on November 8th. Thanks, Amy. Chuck, PSBA. PSBA. I went for a two-day training. I am now a, the, the PSBA ambassador to the Philadelphia and the five-county area. So I will be responsible for bringing services, for bringing uh, awareness of PSBA and the services that they offer and the issues that are out there to the school boards in the surrounding area. I will also be part of the new uh, school board member training program so that when you're trained, you will actually have a school board member there who's been through it. Um, and during my 20 years plus here, I've been through a few different things. Uh, to, to back up, we, we, we did attend, uh, Amy and I did attend the meeting that was put together by PSBA at their, at their conference. And the Keystones are just another example of organizations that don't listen to each other. Amy had alluded to a letter that was written by the two chairmen, the chairman for, uh, from the Democratic side, from the Republican side. They sent it to the Secretary of Education with a list of questions that they wanted answers to. They received a form letter back saying, thank you for your input. That was it. They got nothing, nothing whatsoever. So the frustration level is there uh, with the Senate and there has been talk of the elimination of the Department of Education and putting it, reconstituting it underneath the Senate because legislatively, they're the ones that are responsible for education in Pennsylvania and they're not very happy right now. So that would be the one thing that I would look for that the relationship between the legislators and the Department of Education needs to improve. They really do need to improve. I think, I think we're getting tired of people who are not elected giving us mandates, telling us what to do. The coupling of the keystones for graduation requirement in Pennsylvania was done by the Department of Education. They could uncouple that tomorrow if they wanted to. They asked us to do it or we asked them to do it through our senators, and they got back a form letter. So the frustration level was very high. Um, may I, I'm so sorry, indulge me for 30 seconds okay. here, but one of the things we also talked about at our legislative breakfast was the fact that the Senate, the House, has passed this huge revision to the school code. 
And some one of the things that's included in that, if the Senate votes on it, which I don't know if you have an update, sorry to put you on the spot, Mr. Kane, but the Senate was supposed to take it up on Monday, and I don't know if they did or not. Um, but anyway, one of the things that's in that revision to the school code would be another year's delay on the Keystones as a graduation requirement. So I just thought the parents out there might want to know that it is if this passes, then it's not 2019 when the Keystone exam as a graduation goes into effect. It's actually going to be 20, at least 2020. And one of the other, there are a few big things in there, but one of the other We may be seeing more clearly by then, right? <laughs> yes. And one of the other things in there is mandated school board director training for all new school board members. Um, and that's, a, talk about a battle, that's another little battle between PSBA and the legislature about who exactly is going to, to formulate that school director training. Is that right, Mr. Mann? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Parks and Rec. Please no report. <laughs> it's almost no report. <laughs> the Parks and Rec Department did have a meeting um, uh, scheduled for um, October 12th, and we did not achieve a quorum, so there was no business conducted, but there was a lot of unofficial discussion about the subject of dog walking in the new Clem McCrone Park. So if that is something that is of interest to you, you may wish to follow that um, going forward. And I would also encourage parents to take a look at the uh, township's um, fall activities sheet. There are things coming up. I know, I think even this week, um, a Halloween party here and other items like that. But to get it all clearly and without error, take a look at the uh, fall activities sheet. Thank you. Uh, Ref and the Radnor Alumni Council. So I'm going to speak twice in one night. Um, <laughs> sorry, folks. The All Class Reunion is Saturday, November 4th, 2017, at the Radnor Financial Center after the LM game, which we will hopefully win. Um, should be changed for me. And the Rockout with Ref is Friday, November 10th, 2017, at 7 p.m. Um, it's also the Marine Corps birthday that day, so. So, Mike, just for clarity, the alum, if the if the Lower Marion game gets moved to Monday night because if we make it into to playoffs, the alumni oh, right, event is again. still happening on Saturday. Yeah, they still do. Just want to make sure people yeah. understand they are not connected. Nice to have them back to back, but they're not right. connected. So if the football game moves, yeah, the alumni event that still happened, happens. That happened recently. It, it's going to happen potentially again this year. Yeah, it's so strange to see a good football team. <laughs> The Radnor High School Scholarship Fund. Um, so the Radnor High School Scholarship Fund, uh, their fundraising appeal letters will be going out soon. And while the scholarship fund appreciated the donation that the district made for the offer of an LM Week package uh, in order to help them with their fundraising after we took away the parking permits, uh, in fact, they did not get any bids on that. So when your scholarship fund letter comes in the mail, please give and give generously. Thank you. Radnor Page. Um, the Radnor Page liaisons met with Jim Kearney and I know that they discussed the results of the gifted audit that occurred and they gave some feedback about ways to include uh, students in some of the audit findings as well as they had a conversation about um, how to kind of get at the source of the discrepancy between uh, parent satisfaction, perception of parent satisfaction and teacher perception of parent, of student, you know, student, uh, how they're doing for students. So um, I will, I think that's going to be an ongoing conversation as the page, as the uh, gifted curriculum review goes through its cycle. Thank you. The Radnor Committee for Special Education. Yes, this actually has to do with the impact Keystones can have on, on special education students and, and some of the things that we may need to look at and possibly address as the Keystones will continue to be moved back. And, and I would, uh, if I'm a betting man, which I am, would say that the Keystones will never come in place 
and will never be a, a graduation requirement that's attached to graduation. They will continue to push it back. Our state legislators are really good with kicking the can. They've been doing that. They're going to continue to do it. The people that suffer are the ones, and whether you're um, special education or regular education, and you pass algebra, we'll just say, because I received a letter um, from a special education parent about this, as I think everyone did. And her son, okay, passes algebra one in Radnor. He does very, very well in the classroom. He's a special education student. He does have accommodations. He's allowed to have extra time and he's allowed to go into a small uh, room with a uh, quiet room so that he can do his best, okay? He doesn't pass, doesn't pass. So now what does he have to do? This is going to remediation. So that's going to take time away from him taking other classes so that he can then take the test again. Now, if you look at the statistics of the people who fail it the first time and take it again, it's not very high, um, really. It's not across the state of Pennsylvania. I don't, know, I don't have our specific numbers, but I would be interested in finding that out. So we're spending time, we're spending money, we're trying to help our kids to pass a test that is set up in a way that is very difficult for them to pass. But they've already passed the algebra in Radnor. We as a school board are the people that set the graduation requirements. We should be the ones that say, if you pass algebra in Radnor, you can graduate. And I am very upset with the fact that the parents have to try to wiggle these different things around and we continue with this remediation piece just in case the keystones come into play. And we've been doing this for quite a few years. And we need to look at, is enough enough? What can we do for the special ed population to ensure that they'll graduate if they pass our classes? So what I would like to see us do is with the special education committee, move forward on some type of, of an effort to have the state look at this, in particular for special education, and see if we can just pull this out. Right now, you can, ex you can get an exemption for religious reasons. I think that's, uh, that's a sham. Uh, it should be the reason I don't want my son or daughter to take the Keystone exam is because it hurts them. It hurts them, it hurts their self-esteem, it hurts their educational progress, and it's a disservice to them that we allow this to happen. So I hope we can move forward. And in my new role as an ambassador with the surrounding counties, I will push for this, and, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do something. So I just want the, the um, parents of that special ed student to realize we're here trying to help. It's a difficult issue, but we're trying. And thank you. Thanks, Chuck. Um, next, we have new business. I've never brought up new business. I've barely spoken at meetings, so is there anything special I have to say? I propose new business. Anything? You just let me be me. Um, I propose. <coughs> excuse me. I propose that we consider uh, providing Papa with audits. Uh, audit services, forensic auditing, whatever it is, uh, I, you know, we created this problem and I think we have to make it right. And we are also just about to ask Papa to please hand over all their money so that we can pay new employees. Um, and I, I, think it's, I think it's a little tricky. <laughs> um, not that I don't think Papa would be generous or understand it all, but it's really hard to keep asking parents to pay into a fund that has been unchecked for so long, uh, and then to ask to take the money for out of their control. Uh, whether it's for a good reason or not, that's not what I'm getting at. It's just we need, to, we need our own accountability for what we have done. Julia, I, I'm sorry. I mean, I, I don't know if there was a motion in there, but I, I have I to- I asked if I had to make a motion. Oh, I didn't catch that. <laughs> but here's my, I, I take issue with two things that you said. You made a statement that there's a problem and that we created it. 
And I appreciate that you have concerns about how boosters in general might be funded. We've, we've talked about it at policy. We've talked about it here tonight. We've talked about it. I mean, I, I spoke to Ken, you know, months ago when he first came on board. I said, hey, we should probably come up with some good guidelines about boosters. I never had any particular booster in mind. And I, I have to say I'm, I'm troubled to hear you call out a particular booster group and for you to make a statement that there's a problem, and not only is there a problem, but there's a problem that we've caused. Well, uh, so, let me So let that. me finish. So I respect that I think it would be really good governance on the part of this board to um, create very clear guidelines for how all booster clubs should, should conduct themselves, what are best practices. I've told that to Ken. I've told that to Susan. I've told that to Dave. I've believed it for years. I mean, you could probably go back and find. Correct. It's on our agenda. It's been brought forward. And I just, I'm very, I, I appreciate your right to bring forth new business. I really do. And if your new business is to ask us to formally, you know, put a time frame to, to creating good guidelines for all booster groups, that's great. But I think it's really, I, I am not comfortable with hearing a particular booster group singled out tonight without them having any warning. And I'm very uncomfortable with your pronouncement that there's a problem and that we've caused it. Because I don't know enough about the situation to opine on that. I know that the best way for this district to move forward is to always be thinking about what are the best structures we can have for best practices and to ask all groups who would like to be affiliated with the district to follow what we feel are best practices. And the, and the Finance Committee has every intention of either giving that to the CAC to look at or discussing it amongst themselves. And that's. I, I don't feel comfortable continuing a conversation that's singling out a group. I, okay. I, if you want to continue now, it, it's me, fine. Me I'm going to excuse myself. That's fine with me. Um, first of all, Papa is me. I am Papa. Okay. Oh, I beg your pardon. I pay money in. And anyone who pays money into it as a parent is a Papa member. Yes, I am. Um, and, a member and let of me Papa. finish. I listen to you. And. <laughs> yes. Can you just say for people in the audience? Performing. Performing arts, uh, parents of performing arts, parents, something like that. An association of the Thank performing you. arts. And the point I'm making is, as I outlined, it is a problem that we caused because we stripped away uh, anyone to oversee it. Um, and we continue to make people pay into it without structure. And right now we have, right now we have no oversight of it because it hasn't been structured with uh, people moving on from president to vice president, etc. So I'm not picking on them. It's something that I'm intimately familiar with. And I say it in the context of this entire rehab that we are looking at to our musical program. So you want to put on new business a discussion about this? What exactly, what exactly are you looking for, uh, Julia? I'm looking. In the future, do you want this to be discussed? Um, or are you, are you looking for a motion to do a forensic audit of, of the organization? That could be a motion. I'm looking to well, offer it because, as Ken has pointed out, it's Papa's money. It's not Radner money, even though I think there's a hybrid going on there. Um, and I think we owe it to do that because, really, they've, they've got to take care of their own money. They've got to get a sense of order what's going on. And that's not cheap. And um, then to turn around and say, and by the way, can we have whatever you have? Um, I think that's a big ask without the responsibility around it. Now, just to, just to ask a question, because I don't know the answer to this. The best practices, because we did look in booster clubs over and over and over again, and, and I think there are guidelines that are set out there. And I don't know whether there's an audit guideline or, 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 what, or what there is, but if there is something, then I, I think that could be part of the discussion. I would prefer to have a discussion about this before we move to actually do any kind of, a, any kind of an audit to see if we can come up with a friendly solution to this. So, so generally speaking, I, I don't know anything about Papa personally. Finance Committee for probably three years now, when I was off it, I asked for it. When I got on it, we put it on our agenda of things to do. Um, it was on, it was scheduled to be an item in our October and our November meetings. Um, but of course, Michelle is, is out on leave right now and that has put a hole in it. Um, we had guidelines that had been provided. Um, when we had an issue with another kind of a, a parent organization some years back, 
Um, our auditor at the time had created some guidelines that were good use uh, to train the volunteers of the various organizations. And that took place for probably two, maybe three years, um, where with succession those groups had been trained up. But then it kind of fell to the wayside. Nobody was really paying attention to it. Um, I know that Michelle had reached out uh, to our current auditor to see if they would be willing to provide a similar service. Um, I believe that she has gathered up the documents that we had had from previous. And our job as a finance committee was going to be for us to look at this stuff. I haven't seen it, so uh, I'm saying it yeah. was an agenda item. When well, was it an agenda item? It, it's not. I brought it forth as... Uh, when was it in an agenda item on a finance committee meeting? It's not. It's you you just said it's been on an agenda for two months. It had been. It had been planned. It is on the Never list. Never saw of it. It is on the list of topics oh. for okay, future thank you. agendas for the finance committee. And can I just jump in? That's there? We, different we from have, being on an agenda. And I'll jump in there too. With the, you know. One of the things we looked at as a district and we looked at in, in the spring and trying to set district goals, we tried to establish what are the things we want to look at and what are the things we want to focus on this year, what things are goals, what things are priority projects. And yes, there were um, several board members who had mentioned that, you know, we, we have some work in, in many different areas as a district, one of those being boosters. Um, it was something that didn't rise to the occasion for this year as we looked at our full plate of different items, but it is something that um, based on some of these discussions that we are going to move forward this year and we said that we will um, look to begin a thoughtful and I think it might have been at policy or finance on the two committees are blending right. together finance that we would said that um, uh, come January we would look to come forward the administration would look to come forward with a plan for how we want to establish correct thank you it was finance I'm remembering right. yes but but we want well we want to look at the all aspects of the boosters and we want to look at the aspects of 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 how we um, both from a policy standpoint um, how we partner with our booster clubs and what are the pieces that we need to have in there and so in January the administration will come forward with an action plan and a timeline for here's what this will take um, the one thing we want to do is we look at this make sure that we do it in a thoughtful manner make sure that we are um, uh, looking at this and understanding what are the concerns in um, from all of our different booster clubs as well um, you know our boosters clubs play a great value to our district and the support they do in partnering in so many different areas, uh, but we want to establish um, some type of policy and guidelines moving forward to make sure that the proper checks and balances are there and that we're supporting one another into the future. And, and from, the, from the perspective of where we were coming from with regards to wanting to have this, it's, it was also intended to help to provide assistance to volunteers who might consider wanting to do something such that we could hand you, here's a template for for a good you know budgetary you know for a, a money management here are processes that would keep any kind of potential for problems to stop by having two people in charge when you're counting cash to have two people sign off they're just good practices and the hope was by providing that to the volunteer organizations that that would help to eliminate some of the heavy lifting of some of the volunteers just to make it easier for people to step in. So for me, it was kind of both good checks and balances, but also a way to help those groups uh, get a little more organized and make it easier for volunteers. So the um, whole comment I made about 10 minutes ago that I thought it was inappropriate to have this discussion without having given notice to booster clubs, I mean, we're effectively having the comment. So I would just like to say I think that it was inappropriate to have, I, it's not that anybody, it's not Patty, it's not that anything that you're saying is objectionable, please don't misunderstand it. I just think it's unfair for the booster groups to not, to not be able to know that we were going to be talking about this. Okay. So I'm, that's, that's why I'm concerned about it. It's not anything you're saying. All right, but we have something on our agenda called new business. And new business, in and of itself, means that you can bring up topics that may not necessarily be on the agenda. We should not be taking action on them but that does not prohibit us from talking about what potential issues are out there and what things we might consider for future discussion and or deliberation or decision making. So for me, I'm looking at this more just as a, this is a holistic discussion. I think it's a healthy one. I appreciate to hear that Ken is talking about, you know, bringing it forward as, a, as an initiative from the administration and looking at it at a, at a more whole point of view. It is something that has been missing We've been busy with a whole lot of other stuff. This is an area we need to kind of firm up now that some of the other stuff is, is getting solidified and we can move on to really do the, the, the business of the district. And I think we've been doing a good job of that. 
for the last couple of years. I'd like to see us keep moving forward. I understand Julia's discomfort. I, I would um, support the idea of offering, not mandating, offering to provide some sort of assistance with the finances for that organization since it is now, the district is now trying to help them get reestablished on the volunteer side. And if we are able to offer them that as a potential service, if they need it, the new incoming group can decide whether they want to or not. I would be in support of that so that we can help them get things straightened out and get back onto the right path. I don't, that all said, I want to be painfully clear. I am not suggesting in any way there's anything wrong. I'm just suggesting we offer it as a potential tool for them to help them get back on track. And, and we have already offered to that group the access to our business manager, and they have met with our uh, business manager to help look at some, you know, best practices and and to share uh, how they have been, you know, running their organization. And they're very open to that dialogue and that discussion. Um, and we continue to have that offer, that type of uh, of support. Going back to uh, Susan Stern's comments, and I think that's important to note. You know, we as a board mention a topic, and it does have. Um, you know, it, it has it has a ripple effect in our community. You know, we mentioned boosters, and all of a sudden, all of our booster clubs become very concerned about, oh no, what's going on? What is happening? So, I want to assure and let our booster club know that in looking at a policy and saying that we're going to come forward with in January with an action plan, the whole reason for saying we want to do that in January is because we want to set forward a, 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 a thoughtful plan that will involve our booster leadership in our different groups, and it will take several months to look at this. So, um, you know, January we're not coming forward with here's the answer, here's what we're going to establish. January we're going to step, we're going to come forward with here's the action plan for how we want to tackle this, here's how we want to look at this, here's how we want to begin that dialogue. Um, you know, booster clubs were mentioned, I think, at one of our meetings two meetings ago, and I had a booster chair uh, for a totally different group emailing me saying, what's going on? I want to meet with you, Mr. Bachelor. What's happening with boosters? So I'd like to, you know, assure our booster clubs that, you know, we value that partnership, uh, but we want to, and I think Mrs. Booker, Patty, you mentioned it very well, I think some of them are also starving for some guidance, too. You know, they, they want that help and they want that support, and I think this could be a collaborative process that we could work together to, to establish. I just want to jump in here. Uh, I did. It did occur to me that you know, these boosters are community volunteers, and so I, I just want to say my opinion is that you know hats off to you guys for giving your time, and um, I want to assure people that this might seem like a very odd conversation, but your efforts as community volunteers are so appreciated, and so just to reassure people. Anything further, Julia? I think I'm done for the night. Any other new business? Um, yes, I do have something. And um, I was fiddling with my phone, and I want people to know that I was trying to look this up, what I want to announce. The Delaware County, the Delaware County Annual Thanksgiving Food Drive is on again, um, and it's sponsored by a whole bunch of good agencies, the Delaware County Council, the Community Department of Human Services, the Office of Behavioral Health, the County Department of Inner Community Health, and Magellan Behavioral Health. Um, the reason I'm bringing this up is that they will be having their food drive up through November 15th. November 17th, and there are drop boxes throughout various buildings of the DCIU. Um, and so I'm saying this because I know Radnor High School students in particular are a motivated and caring group of students, and I wanted to um, suggest that this might be something that our community could participate in. So if anyone hears this and you're so motivated, you can reach out to me and I'll um, give you some more information about how to participate. Thanks. Next, we have board announcements. Um, we have some upcoming meetings, uh, noting the date as we're changing some of the, uh, the schedule that we would normally have. So on November 14th, there will be a facilities committee meeting at 5 o'clock, a policy meeting at 6 o'clock, 
a Finance Committee meeting at 7, and also a GRCC meeting at 8. They will all be held at the Administration Building. On November 28th, which would be the date of our regular board business meeting, there will also be a Curriculum Committee meeting at 4.30. That will be right here, and then there will be a regular business meeting at 7 p.m. again, right here. Public comment. Judy Sherry. Um, just a, a couple of comments about the, all this discussion regarding the musical. To me, like when I hear bouncing ball and finances in the same sentence, I start worrying. Um, and also, when I hear board members say the fact that we might be paying someone twice for the same job doesn't concern me, that does concern me um, since I'm a taxpayer here and I don't want to pay someone twice for the same job. Uh, Sue Stern, I think, mentioned that we're going to reevaluate this process of now that we're going to be funding this musical in a completely different way, which is a good idea, but you can't reevaluate something unless you know where you were in the past. So if you don't know what happened in previous years, how can you evaluate what you're doing this year and compare it with anything relevant? Uh, I did hear, I thought, um, Mr. Falcone mentioned the word, some analysis was done. Uh, is that pu for public consumption? Can we know what the analysis was that caused this new change of um, funding this, um, these positions? So there are just a few questions I had from that discussion. And my comments. Um, with election day only two weeks away, the lack of participation at meetings and, well, I could say the insufficient participation in meetings and in letters to the editors of the four new school board candidates has been stunning. If you do a search on the school district's website, one candidate's comments come up once and another's twice and two candidates not at all. It's really a virtual closed book as to what these candidates stand for. For example, who knows what these candidates think about the five-year, the new five-year teacher contract? Do they endorse the Citizens Advisory Committee? And will they endorse an earlier start time to improve sleep issues? Will they take steps to prevent and reduce brain injuries in athletes? Will they provide a check on booster clubs? Will they sell the district's private residential properties? Will they renegotiate the tri-party agreement? Will they promote Mandarin? How will they respect the role of the public? Do they believe in transparency in, disclose, in disclosing employee benefits? And on and on. These are a few of the many issues that have deserved attention over the past nine months and yet have not merited even a comment or a letter to the editor. Or if so, it was in passing or I missed it. But what's really amazing and unbelievable is that it's hard to tell in some instances here what incumbent board members think about these important topics. Hopefully, the newspaper and the League of Women Voters will succeed in getting some clarifications of the positions of these candidates before the election. Unfortunately, if past history is an indication, it doesn't appear that any of them will speak up and show leadership if elected. Good luck, voters, on making the right choices. Thank you. Cindy Spurtle Wayne. Sitting back and listening to this conversation that we've been listening to on booster clubs, especially the one on the PAPA, um, makes me think that very often we go into these studies and reviews and it takes forever before there's a final answer or an outcome. This appears to be extremely important. There obviously was an analysis done that made this decision to take over 
the um, these new positions to add these new positions to as contract employees so that means that there there may or may not be but it appears to be there was a problem or there's an opportunity for something new to be done so my request as a member of the public is not to drag this study out a review or analysis should be started immediately following the production the musical that it's going to happen this fall. We're looking for next year to come up with an answer, my, at least listening to this discussion, that um, the answers would be right after and following the production that would be the best time to do the analysis. And if you want to go through this Booster Club analysis, as I had mentioned in my opening comments, back in 2009 there was quite a bit of work put into this and it's right on the website. Thank you. Any other public comment here? I know we've got some emailed. Oh, Bill, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Falcone. Uh, Bill Morrissey, 13 Grant Lane. Uh, I am a candidate for school board, just to disclose that. Um, I had not planned on speaking today, so I'm a little nervous. It's my first time. Uh, I just wanted to respond to Ms. Sherry's uh, comments about lack of information from the candidates. Uh, I, I think, and I want to speak for all of them, certainly I haven't discussed this with uh, the Democrats that are running, but I think we're all running for these positions for the first time. So I know I'm a novice politician, uh, which may be evident from my shaking and, and uh, nervous voice, but I know Eric is a first time candidate and I believe that uh, Sarah and uh, uh, Andrew are also first-time candidates. And I will say it's a little more challenging than I expected in some regards. One of the things that's challenging is trying to convey uh, our views. The, the, when I first started running, I thought, uh, like many do, that there shouldn't be parties uh, or party affiliation when you're running for school board. But, but when I started running, I realized that the party actually is very useful in helping us get our message out, helping get signs printed, helping get uh, Palm, palm cards, which I'd never even heard of, although I'd received them many times while voting, but I didn't know what they were called, getting palm cards out. So all those things are helpful. There's also a lot of messages, and, and Ms. Michelson will be the first to attest, uh, the new candidates are not always extremely proactive in getting the messages out because we don't know that messages need to go out. We don't know that there's postcards that need to go out. I've never been to a League of Women uh, Voters meeting. There's one on Thursday. It's at 7 o'clock. We're trying to find out where it is. So if anybody knows where, is it here? Great, so that's a little advertisement for the League of Women Voters. I heard they're gonna ask us lots of questions. Um, there might be public questions, so Ms. Sherry, you're welcome to ask questions. So Bill, and I know we, can, we can't really campaign from the podium, oh, I'm sorry. so if you've got so, a, a so my, comment. My point is, yeah, I'll say this for all the candidates. I mean, I'm, I think everybody's happy to answer questions. So just, that was it, thank you. Thank you. At, yeah, exactly. Comfy chair up here in a walnut back dais in this beautiful building on TV. Relaxing. Anybody else from the public? Mr. Petiti, anything by email by chance? Yes, I have one email from Art Sherry. Good evening. Dave Falcone, the president of the school board, is a partner at Saul Ewing. Saul Ewing is also a renter township school district's bond council. The Government Finance Officers Association, GFOA, is a professional association of approximately 18,500 state, provincial, and local government finance officers in the United States and Canada. GFOA recommends that issuers select their bond council on the basis of merit using a competitive process and review those relationships on a regular basis. What is the RFP process for Radnor Township School District's Bond Council? How long has Saul Ewing, the law firm where Dave Falcone is a partner, been our bond council? Does Saul Ewing receive contingency fees for Radnor Township School District's debt restructuring? If so, how does that not have a financial impact on Dave Falcone, a partner at Saul Ewing? At the Radnor Township Commissioner's meeting last night, Dave Falcone. M Mrs. Made Michelson? Are, are you going to comment? He's not finished. 
Uh, don't we need to let him finish? No, when a, when, a, when a member of the public makes comment where they single out a particular board member, we actually have a policy that we just passed that we're supposed to stop the public comment. So I'm going to respectfully ask that the public comment be stopped. I would, I would interrupt the person if he came here tonight. It's singling out a board member. Except you're not supposed to, because they're supposed to be That's why I just asked Mrs. Michelson. So, so okay. by our own policy speak or not? So it, it really is at the board's discretion. You know, I, I've recused myself on the matters where Saul Ewing's been voted on. So that's so it's a, it's a, it finish the questions. We can there are answers to most of those questions. We yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, uh. Um, at, at the Radnor Times Commissioner's meeting last night, Dave Falcone made it clear to me that his priority is his law firm and his client, Penn Medicine. I encourage you all to watch his speech and decide for yourselves. It can be found on Radnor Township YouTube page at the two hour, 36 minute mark of the October 23rd, 2017 meeting. Kudos to Commissioner Booker for seeing right through it. A final request, will you please follow Radnor Township's lead and put your meetings on YouTube. The live streaming media portal link on your website doesn't work and never has in my or my peers attempts to use it. This is an easy fix and should be taken care of immediately. All right. So I'll just offer so that I've um, I've recused myself on all matters involving Saul Ewing and the University of Pennsylvania. So, I, and I will I will absolutely second that. I spent um, uh, half an hour at the end of the last meeting and a half an hour at the beginning of this meeting executing documents related to the bond issue, uh, uh, wherein Saul Ewing served as our bond counsel. Saul Ewing has been our bond counsel for I think it's five years. Five, at least five years, longer than Mr. Falcone's yes. tenure on this board. That is an important thing to understand. Um, we do not pay them a contingency fee. The fees that they uh, are, are charged are wrapped into each issue which we have, and they are well disclosed and competitive as we understand it, because believe me, people are watching. Um, the only other thing I, I, that I'll add just okay, as finance go ahead. chair sure, I'm is sorry, that we sure. do. No, no, it's okay. okay. I mean, you should be answering it. I'm just well, saying as finance chair, I'll just add one piece with regards to um, how do we go through the process of, of hiring the various firms, whether it's our solicitor or whether it's a bond council or other agencies that we use with some regularity. And that does go through a cycle of review. Um, We'll have to pull it up. I can't remember the last time we reviewed it in this particular case, but it's normally a topic at the Finance Committee meeting to say, here are the different contracts and services that we do, what's our review cycle, and when do they next come up? And it's not really triggered off of any other particular event other than time. And with regard to the second portion of Mr. Sherry's comment regarding the meeting last night at the Board of Commissioners, I appeared there on behalf of a client, and I would implore everyone to go to that two-hour and 36-minute mark and take a look at that speech. I'd like to <laughs> I would like to say something. And I want to follow up on Susan's point. And I really think this is Susan. Both of you, perhaps. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, because this is for everybody. I really I mean, Susan Stern was right. We have a policy that says explicitly in policy zero six that we should not entertain any public comment that is personally directed at anybody. We have maintained a nice atmosphere here. And let's not let that go. That benefits the community more than anybody else in our students. And I would encourage anyone who has any questions about that to review policy 006 and understand there, there are certainly things that people may take issue with us about and that's what the public is there for but please don't turn this environment into i watched the board of commissioners meeting last night and please don't let that happen in this district it's up incumbent upon us as board members to make sure that people abide by our policies to protect not just us as board members but everybody in this community so that people can feel free to come and participate to whatever extent they want. They can feel safe. They can feel welcome. And I think we have a responsibility as board members to do that. And I would, I would say that for anybody who was a, um, for whom this policy was violated. 
Well, I want to jump on the back of that, too, and say that this may be kind of the first time it played out. And it was yeah. maybe, well, I'm going to say it was directed at Mr. Falcone, who is the presiding officer. So I would just like to say, to second what Amy and Susan are saying, and so to sort of encourage Mrs. Michelson to feel free to step in. If, if the presiding officer is being attacked, then it maybe hasn't happened in that sequence before, but then I think you should feel free to... That's fine. I, and, and I hear you. And first of all, Amy, you are correct. We want to maintain an open and collegial atmosphere on this board. Absolutely. Um, Mr. Falcone has, was sitting right here. Um, he knew what was coming. We all knew what was coming. We got an email. Um, so in that sense, um, I also think it's important to listen to what people have to say. I will say that he is frequently targeted on this board um, by public commenters, and we have not in the past been in the practice of shutting that down. I most certainly did oh, a few months I, ago. Oh, no. Oh, no. It yes, has, I did. Susan, it's on tape, and it was reported in the newspaper by Mrs. Stein. She actually took issue with the fact that I defended Mr. Falcone. Right, but, but my point is it happens regularly, and it's not always shut down. And we had answers for each. Sorry? Okay, well, well let's, let's not so argue. Let's not, We're trying let's to not have that. Yeah, I think kind of right digressing now. away from yeah. it. Look, I, the, the so, point here. The point here is we had responses for each one of these things. They that the business of the board with regard to these um, uh, questions had answers, and they needed to be cleared. And I don't want to be involved in shutting down a discussion uh, because I think that sounds also like we're trying to cover something up. There was nothing to cover up here. There so was you, nothing to cover okay, up. Okay, okay. Let's let's so, keep, look, so wait, can we keep I'll kind of wrap this up and let's so, keep it so peaceful. we we generally have pretty peaceful meetings and I think it's very fair to say I am frequently the the um, attack uh, okay. individual on this board. And you know what? I guess that's part of the job that I have as board president or as a board member and maybe there are particular members of the public that don't like me a whole lot or like what I do a whole lot and you know what? It's all good. It is fine. Dave, it's, Dave, um, I want to say something, though. Because so hold on, wait. So, and I appreciate everybody being mindful of this policy, and I think as a general rule we should be. Because what we are doing here, I think generally the nine of us are doing our, our level best for this district. And that should be kept in mind. You, maybe not you, Miller, but you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> but I think as a general rule, we're doing our best, and if there are folks out there that question our, our, um, our actions in that regard, I think we are open to that attack. However, I will say I don't think this forum or any forum is appropriate for personal attacks. I think they um, change the tone and tenor of the way we do business, and I think that in, in those instances, um, all we can do is ask our public to be mindful of our policy and hope that they follow it. But, you know, I think it's a pretty general rule of thumb that it, everything comes down to the way it's said. Somebody could question anything that anybody on the board is doing. It's a matter of how it's said in my book, my rule book, my personal rule book. So I would just encourage people who want to challenge things, and absolutely, I mean, the public has to hold us accountable. That's what we're here for. Um, but I think we would just ask you to please consider how you address the issues that you have with us not just because we're fellow human beings too and it doesn't feel very good to get, it, to get attacked. Um, please frame your question or concern in a way that isn't attacking. I think we all as adults know how to do that. But also be mindful of all the other people who want to come to meetings who don't because they don't want to be subjected to that kind of um, tenor in the room. So. Um, I, I just wanted to be clear. I don't want to shut anybody down ever. I'm just asking that when you do have a concern or a criticism to express, to please, in accordance with our policy, if not out of human decency, to please express it in a way that doesn't come across as attacking. That's all I wanted to say. And I'll Great. add to that. It has to go both ways, both in private meetings and in these public meetings, because I think we all need to be reminded of that. So that's great. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? It's a really good meeting for you tonight, Miller. <laughs> hey, I spoke three times. I think that's my